Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It's nine o'clock, it's Christmas Day, and I have got a huge, huge interview with you today. I have got with me who I consider to be, the person who I consider to be the number one magician, stroke mentalist in the world. I don't think there's anybody that is at this person's level when it comes to mentalism. He's been on the channel before. He's one of very few people that have come back on again. I am, of course, talking about somebody who's creating waves at the moment. Everyone's talking about the one and only Pete Turner. How are you doing, Pete? You okay? I'm good, Craig. Thank you for the introduction. I'm sort of a bit worried now. You Mate, set the bar so high. You know, me and Lloyd Barnes were doing the podcast last week and we were discussing mentalism and we both came to the same conclusion. There's some incredible mentalists out there, but for our money, there's nobody who really touches you. I mean, you, you make it real. Like you have this ability to take mentalism and just really make, and there's very few people that can do that. People watch you and just convinced that what you're doing is 100% real. It's just, it's, a, it's going to be a weird comment. It's Incredible. because it, it, for me, it is real. You know, I know it sounds daft if it's something that I can tangibly do. I, I tried to a lot early on, try to make it as real as possible. And the only way we have a reference for, for what is real is to try for real and then just replicate that. So, but, but yeah, no, I don't, I wouldn't consider myself, I've got to say, I wouldn't consider myself the best or anywhere close. I just, I'm just, uh, I, I just love what I do. I, you know, I spend my, as much time as I can engrossed in this and, and I know we've, you know, we've had chats backwards and forwards about ideas and other bits and bats. And I think people only really see 2% of what it is that I actually contribute to Magic and Mentalism. They don't get to see all the other projects that I'm working on for other people and the other things that I create. And they'll look at something like that. And the stylistically, it's so different to what I put out in my products. They never connect the dots and realize it's actually something that I've created. It's, it's nuts. And, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to get you onto the channel, because obviously we've done an interview before. We talked about your life. We talked about your career. We talked about how you got involved in, in mentalism and magic and how you went from where you started through to where you are now. But the purpose for this interview is to kind of pick, on, pick up from that point, because when I interviewed you before, you were pretty much the poster boy for illusionist. Uh, how to control minds was just about to come out, how to read minds had become probably their most successful products in years. Fast forward a year and a half, wherever we are now, we're out of COVID. And, you know, how to read minds two is out. So there's a lot of questions that are going on about that. But as well as how to read minds two, th there's questions within the community. Is Pete still an illusionist? Has he left illusionist? What's going on? I put a video out recently, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of titled The Downfall of Illusionist, and it was really kind of looking about them as a, as a company. And I had so many questions about Illusionist. More importantly, I had even more questions about you and how to read minds too, and what's happening with you and what's happening with that kit and whether people should invest in it and, and what's going on. And I thought the best way to deal with this rather than me guess, is to bring the man himself onto the channel and 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 talk to you about everything, if that's okay. You can ask me anything. There's there's obviously, if there's ever any questions that I think are a little bit close to the bone, I am still under a, an NDA just, just until the new year. So, but there's not really much that I, you know, that I can't say you can ask me anything and I'll do my best to answer. I'll try to be as honest as possible. You know, that's all I, that's all I can do. Uh, yeah, I'm no longer an illusionist. I worked for for illusionist for nearly six months. I think maybe five months, six months. So it's it's nearly half a year. But I think because there are products coming out that I filmed prior to me leaving, I don't think people really understood how much work that I actually did whilst I were there. I think that people from the outside looking in, so I saw he's down in London, he's doing this, and now he's in Vegas, he's doing that, and it seems like a holiday. But it wasn't. It were a lot of time planning and a lot of time filming, and a lot of it were for no financial reward. A lot of things I did extracurricular, you know, that were outside of my hours that I did because I wanted to do and I wanted to spend time with Mark and I wanted to spend time with the guys. So I just, I just did them. But yeah, you can ask me. You can ask me absolutely anything, and I'll try to be as open as possible. On the subject of that, I know that you did, and a lot of people don't realize this, with how to read minds one which was a phenomenal success on every level, financially, reviews, absolutely everything. So many people love that kit. 
you did everything, didn't you? I mean, you did the majority of the work when it came to the editing and the performing and the tutorials. And it really, how it was presented was your vision. Uh, the, the, the How to Control Minds were the one that I had the, the biggest hand in, and that was the, the most successful one on the Kickstarter. But How to Read Minds, what had happened was Lloyd Barnes was still at the company at that time, and they had an idea of what they wanted to do. They, they had an idea of, we want a credit card in there, we want, like, this in there. And they'd picked a couple of things that they wanted in there, and they sort of at first came in on a consultancy-type basis. So I wasn't working for the company to start with. I'd gone in, uh, we jokingly said uh, in Vegas, so I, you know, well, let's do some work together. And what, it, what to start with is, like, a trial period of almost me consulting. And then I picked apart all the stuff inside the set, and then that set, I had three weeks. So like, you know, in the trailer, Brad says, we give Pete Turner three weeks to prepare. That's true. A lot of the props that were in that set had, were ideas that I'd worked on before. I'd worked on, I'd done stuff with credit cards. I have a catalogue of stuff that's credit card related. I have a, a catalogue of stuff that's ESP card related and book test related and I know about word revelation. So it were it really like a, a natural fit. The only thing that I sort of, and again, I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but you know, I'm like for tangents. I didn't like the ESP cards. So like that were the, the first thing. But what people don't understand about working for a company like Illusionist, it's not about my say. And it's not about Lloyd Barnes's say. And it's not about Geraint Clark's say or Brad Christian's say. If Brad Christian came down to me and said, Pete, I want you to do this, 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 we'd vote on it. And the majority of votes were the thing that swung whether we'd use something or we wouldn't. So, so even Brad Christian's word could be outvoted or my word could be outvoted. And so I didn't like the ESP cards. Um, I like ESP cards. I just didn't like the ones that were in the box. They were the only thing that I did prop-wise that I felt were a little bit not the way that I'd have done it. And I brought up my reservations. And then obviously they had a vote and they decided to keep them. And there were this feature where you could see through them. And I, that was the bit that I didn't like because it made it very difficult in a light room to perform with them. But I have to say that in Vegas, I met with people that had them in their wallet and said they were the best cards that they'd ever had because of the durability. So it's not about, it wasn't about me. But that when when the criticism happened, that was the only thing that were critiqued about that kit, right? That, that was the only thing that were attacked about the kit with the ESP cards. So I thought that, the second time round, when it came to out of control minds, which directly answers your question now, is one of the caveats of me creating that or doing that project was that I'd have more say in it because I refused to put myself in the firing line for producing. And it wasn't originally meant to be a box. So this is the bit that people don't understand, right? It was originally meant to be a download and the working title of the download were Jedi. And the original concept were going to be me walking up to a club, a bouncer stops me from going in and I say, no, no, it's fine. And I do the Jedi wave and I go in, I get free drinks and I'm using these mind control techniques in this set of obscure environments. That were the original concept that were for the download. Now, we had a discussion last time about the Stackwatch trailer. Yeah, I remember. And years and years ago, I used to, I used to stick to the format that's expected of magicians and mentalists. And that format is perform the trick. It doesn't matter if it's a studio version. I have a rule. So the rule that I have, if the trick is mechanical, so it'll work the same every time. If it's a playing card force or they're writing something on a billet, then I'll perform it out in the real world. If it's psycho, sorry, I'll perform it on my friends. I don't mind doing studio performances because the performances on my friends are going to be the same every time. The outcome's going to be the same. If it's something psychological, I'll go out and I'll do it in the real world. So you see it on real world people. Yeah. Now, contrary to popular belief, there's no actors in any of the trailers, the screaming reactions that you see in the... In, that's just us picking the right people. And I'll get more, more into that in a second. That's just us picking the right people. Knowing after, I mean, you know, I consult. So I'm used to finding the right people. I can look at a group and go, they're going to be great for trailer reactions. We'll use those. It's just about having that eye and knowing. That's And, you know, and so I'll go out in the real world and I'll perform psychological stuff. The only time that I broke that rule, the only time that I broke that rule is in COVID when I did the legacy series stuff. 
because we couldn't go out and perform to real world people at the time. You were only allowed to meet with a little group of six people. And we made sure that outside of our one or two family members, the, the crew were down to that six. So four people maximum. So we could only we could only ever meet in a group of six. And so when I were doing some of the legacy stuff, there were a couple of psychological things that I did in the, the performances for those. And I performed on like Mark or Dwayne or Grind. And that was because we couldn't go out into the real world to do them. So they're the rules that I set in place for myself. But one of the stipulations was that this time, if I'm doing this, I want to have control of the edit. And, and looking at like the Stackwatch trail, I soon changed my format from, I'm going to do performance explanation. And it, and it wasn't a consciously, it wasn't a conscious choice where I went, right, okay, I want to stand out and be different. It were just, look, this is my vision. This is my canvas. These are my paints. So when I did Bigger Fish Files, I did a television episode, and then I broke that down. So instead of instead of a performance explanation, you know, I'm not on stage. I'm making a TV show, and now I'm explaining the TV show. You know, so it's so that that that's sort of my format in my head. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so when it came to out of control minds, I wanted this look, this aesthetic of this is how I want to do it, and then. Literally one or two months before going in to film that, I started I started talking to Mark again about the Dice Man stuff. Now, I have on my phone about a thousand videos that never made it into the How to Control Minds stuff because we had to cherry pick what went into it. And like, there's a story in the book about two people trying to mug Mark. And I've got the video of the aftermath of that. I've got all of these two guys and I'm literally telling them, try take some out of my pocket. And I never heard anything like that. And I had people saying, oh yeah, but those stories in the book, they're just a lie. It's all just for dramatic effect. I literally did, I, I literally lived as the dice man. I did and I, and it were, and when you see me in, in the video saying like, I'm at the point where I want to quit and this, that's all true stuff. I mean, obviously there were times where I had to break that to, if I'm staying with my family or if I was seeing my son, there were no way that I was subjecting my son to having to, to, to live that life. For me, I want filming every moment of my life. Yeah. So what you're seeing on camera there is, is as honest a representation as it can be. And that's what I wanted. I wanted that documentary based on the Dice Man. There wasn't enough dice rolls in there. Like the edit I sat in on, the first half, I went down to Wales and I sat with Dwayne for two or three weeks straight. And this is not an exaggeration. I mean, you, Dwayne, his patience levels for having me there. I was staying at a hotel. I walk across the road at nine o'clock in the morning and I'd leave at three, four in the morning. And I were back at his house at nine o'clock the next day. And there were no breaks in between for dinner. It would just bring it in. We have a quick, quick snack. Somebody had, like, you know, his partner would bring it in. We'd have a quick snack. We'd keep working. And every minute of it, were constructed and designed the way that I had it in my head. I want to be sat in this chair. This is that piece of footage that I want from there. This is this. The second half, I had to do it from, I couldn't do another three weeks of it because I had consulting. So I had to do it from a distance. And so it, it were made to the specifications, basically, of what I wanted. And the trailer were cut the way that I wanted it. Now, I'm not saying for a second that other people didn't have a look in at that trailer and say, this should be there, this should be there, because they did but it were more a case of here's a bit more freedom. And um, regardless of whether people like the project or not, I mean, that, that is important. I'm not saying it's not, but you look at this, the numbers on that, on, on the Kickstarter, and because it was a project that were from the heart, and, it, and you said yourself before it came out, Pete Turner has been doing this stuff for 10 years. It really was stuff that I'd worked in every environment possible. I tested it in every environment possible. It, for me, we're at a point where it were bulletproof enough to put it in there. Then the concept were voted on to turn it into a box. So that wasn't my decision, right? Like that wasn't my decision. I like the box. I love the red, the look of the box. I like the idea that it sits on your shelf. I like the commemorative dice. I like the book. I like the pen. It could have been a download, but like I said to you, I think last time is it were going to be $99 regardless of whether it had a box or not. So the only people that were benefiting by getting a box were the consumer. Yeah. It'd have been the same price regardless. If I'm sure if somebody had emailed Illusionist and said, look, 
I don't want you to send me the box, but I'm going to pay you the $99. Just send me the links to the files or put them in my account. I'm sure they'd have probably done that. Yeah. So, you know, so it's, but, but yeah, so then that leads to this. So no, I'm not, I'm not with illusionist. I am featured on this set. Um, I'm featured. It's me. That's, you know, that, that's on the set. The, the difference between this set and how to control minds is because I were, I were at the point where we knew we were, how to read minds two has probably been in the works since how to read minds one. I think it would probably even discussed a week or two after how to read minds one, you know, like get thinking about what you want to do. And I assumed, and this is not me saying anything negative about the company, that I'd have full control of what went into the second box. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that I didn't have a lot of control because I did. Like, I can't sit here and say that there's any fault on their part, but I have to honour the voting system. That's part of the thing. If I if I start to say, look, you're doing this because I said it, yeah, I'd never do that, you know? Like, so, so then I didn't decide on all the props inside the box. So that's that's something. I'm not part of the editing process for the trailer, although edits were sent to me. But what my say would have made practically no difference on how the trailer were edited. Like if I had turned around and said, look, take that bit out, I don't want you saying this. I'm sure they'd have probably to some degree compromised with what I said if it were going to be damaging to me. But I didn't edit the trailer. I didn't edit the project. I've not seen any of the footage for the project other than what I shot which I'll get into in a moment. I'm not part of the quality control for the props. I don't even get a say on the quality of the props. I probably won't get to touch the props. I don't know. Maybe they'll give me them to sign off on. I don't know. I don't, I'm not. It's one of those where I, what I don't want is I don't want people to buy the set and then complain at me for the quality of the props that are inside it. I, I'm going to stay open. I have no say on the R&D of the props. I have no say on the quality control I have no say. Look, it's not on me to do that. I left the company six months ago. I'm honouring my commitment to finish the box because I started it yeah. when I were at the company. That's it. That's as far as my involvement in the box goes. The ideas are mine. The yeah. explanations are mine. That like I, I've, I, Everybody I've had to reach out to, if an idea is somebody else's, I've reached out to and we can discuss that in a second. But how to control minds, it were a passion project. I'm not saying this wasn't but I'm saying that this was more of a, a team built project where everybody had a vote, decided on what we're going to go in on it. And I just, I just presented what I could. Well, before we talk about the, 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 the new kit, let's address the elephant in the room. What did made you, what did make you kind of move away from illusionist? Because it seemed like everything was going great. You know, like, like I said, you were the face of the company, Statwatch. watch, Huge seller, Statwatch 2, huge seller, How to Control Minds, huge seller. And you said yourself just there, you assumed that when How to Wade Minds 2 came out, you would have control over the whole box. And if you were still there, you know, would that be the case? Would that not be the case? Don't know. Um, I think if I think if I were there, I would. Yeah. I think if I were there, I'd have a vote. So um, what side to um what what was the reasoning behind parting ways with E? So like I, I'm going to preface this by saying that I absolutely have no problems with anybody that's still at the company. In fact, I still, I still talk to people there, you know, like there were no, there were no hard feelings, but it's, I, I had other things that were happening in the background and I'm going to try to answer this as carefully as possible. And it's not me trying to skirt around it, but I don't want to offend anybody because that's not my intention. And you know, that intention is everything, right? But I want to be as, as straightforward as possible. So I created a book before I joined Illusionist called Attic Salt. And uh, Attic Salt, the idea that I had with that book is I wanted to send it to a, a series of people that claim they didn't like my work, right? So I wrote it in a pseudonym. And the only review copies that I sent out, excluding a few friends, were sent to people that had stated previously they didn't like my work. And I wanted to see whether it was just me they didn't like or my work. And when I sent them the book, it got like amazing glowing reviews. You know, this is the best book I've ever read. And, and the book had been sat there for four years. So I'd wrote it 2018, 2019, it got put on Michael's roster. End of 2019, COVID started to creep in. Or it might have been 2020, maybe 2000. Wait, 2000 I can't even remember. It's been a, a, a mess. But basically, I... 
illusionists were never going to be a permanent thing. Like let's let's be let's be realistic. Like every, everything has to have an expiration, and it's not anything against illusionists. It's just about when you're creative, you've got to ride through that period, and then you know something else might take your interest. And they never restricted me, and they never held me down. They always let me consult. They always let me do lectures. And if I'm really honest, like if I'm brutally honest, through COVID, they were a godsend. When yeah. I couldn't go out of my house, well, when I couldn't go out or nobody could go out, they were still giving me a salary. So, so you know, Brad and, and everybody else there were, were a lifeline. And I can't ever, I never take away from the fact that they did that. Coming out on the other side of COVID and everything started to normalize itself. I wanted to, this book had been finished and I wanted to release it. I decided that I didn't want to rewrite the whole thing and put my name in it. So even though it was designed by me, it went out under the title Henry E. Lyon or Leon. Um, and that went out and then that like a major success sold out in like a couple of hours. Like people, people were complaining when people reviewed it because they felt that they were being taunted at the fact that they couldn't get a copy of the book. He sold that fast, right? It was, it was nuts, like really nuts. And it was a totally different audience to the illusionist audience. Like these were, you, you got to remember that outside of the illusion, the illusionist stuff were more commercial based stuff. That's not really where my head lies with my own creations. Like I, I were always compromising artistically to match the vision of the vote system. So, so even though how to control minds was mine, and that's a glimmer of a glimmer of my stuff, and, and the legacy series is a glimmer of my stuff, like the stack watch. There were input and votes from other people that made certain decisions, which we, we'll touch upon because I know that, that there's a couple of things that I want to address there. But this book were mine and everything in it were mine. And and when I put that out, like it really felt like home. It really felt like, oh, I can go back to having 100% of the say. And if there is consequence to what I've said, that's directly re my responsibility. Like I was the one who took all the heat for the ESP cards in the first box because people don't know that there's a voting system and that that wasn't my decision. Not to say that it's a problem with anybody else, you know, like the ESP cards do what they do and some people love them, but I was the one that took the flack because it had my name stapled to it. And that were a constant, through, whenever you're working with a team of people that make decisions and you're the face of it, people only know that the face is the person that they can blame or complain to. And so, so it were a lot of responsibility. And then, like, I didn't quit and I wasn't fired. It's a really weird situation. And it was not, I, I, you know, I don't know why illusionists made the decision. They asked me if I'd move from a salary basis to royalty, like a royalty basis. So if you don't know the difference between that, if you're watching this, when you release a product, usually there's two ways that it works. You either take a buyout which they'll give you however much money up front to buy the product from you. And maybe they'll buy it for five years or they own it entirely and they can market it and do whatever they want with it. Or they give you royalties and, and royalties mean that for everyone that sells, you get a percentage. What a lot of people don't realize, I think they seem to think that creators, as soon as they release their first book, are millionaires or DVDs, millionaires. And it's not, you know, you know, you, you might get told that you're going to get 25% from a company that wholesales, but then you are then you are going to get 25%, but you might be getting 25% of 40%. Do you know what I mean? Like it's a reduced diminished number. And if it's, if it's a 50 pound product, you might come out with 10 pound, eight pound after cost. Do you know what I mean? So it, it really isn't financial. It's not something that's going to make financially stable releasing magic products. A salary is a lot like that, but what they're doing is they're buying your time. So they're giving you a buyout for your time. So from these hours, whatever your creative output is, if they want you to perform on this trailer, you do it. If if they make a vote that you say something on a trailer that you didn't write and the three people have voted it, you can't really go against the grain. You've got to say things that you wouldn't necessarily say. And, and that's because they're paying your wages. Now, people can say that I sold out. But I didn't, for me, it were a buy-in. Like, it boosted my profile. It sailed me through COVID, and it allowed me to produce things that I never had the budget to produce, like the How to Control Minds documentary. 
and how to control mind stuff. Like I, I, I don't, I can't just decide to fly around the world and and film a full documentary and have a team on hand and you know, like it's not. And I'm not saying that I'm I'm that in that much of a financially bad, but it's just not feasible financially. So when you've got the backing of a corporation, albeit a small corporation, it allowed me to artistically blossom. Yeah. And and when we got to the sort of the end of that, I think our visions were starting to separate. And, the, and it was just the right time for them to ask me if, you know, and to be honest with you, I mean, how many times can you, th there's a ceiling limit to what a company can pay somebody. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And when I'm putting more time in and I'm doing more, I want more because I'm that's time I'm taking from my family and my friends or doing something that I love. And so when they hit that ceiling limit, I think it were only fair for them to offer me percentage so that that i got paid when they got paid yeah but i didn't want that so that wasn't that wasn't why i were at the company i were there for that stability through that period and yeah. and because i had things that i wanted to go off and do anyway it just seemed like the natural time to turn around and say look i don't really want to do royalties like if, if it's not a salary basis at the rate that i'm asking for then you know like we've come to the end of our journey, but that doesn't mean that the door's not open for us to, to continue doing things. But I have to accept that when we do things together, that there's a voting system and I've got to honor that voting system. Yeah. So you know what I mean? So, so and, that, and that's what I like about you, Pete, as far as I know, and I, I speak to a lot of people, you've never burnt any bridges ever with any company, you know, people, would be, I, I think you could probably pick up the phone to any magic company anywhere in the world and go, hey, want to work with me? And they they bite your hand off. Yeah, I, like not purposefully. I mean, I, like I, I'm, so we all say things, I think, sometimes in the heat of the moment that we regret 10 minutes later, you know, and I, and I have I have had rants at companies and thought, but all only when I felt were just. And I'm and like there's been times where certain companies have had people illegally upload stuff of mine, take royalties for it, and then they refuse to take it down. I think I'm just in that situation to turn around and say, look, that you don't own the IP to that. So why is it selling? We shouldn't be all selling. And 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 it, just two weeks ago, the same product that I had a rant about two years ago were back up on wholesale again. And it somehow slipped back through the cracks. I, I've said things about companies that I don't regret saying. But I'm I'm the sort of person that if I'm not I and to be fair you know I said things behind closed doors before I ever said anything publicly I'm always fair like that so I'm never I don't try to I don't want to burn bridges I don't want to fall out with people I don't want to argue with people I don't I just want to, I just want the most simple I love my mentalism and I just want to I just want to go perform it I want to capture my vision and I want to share my art and that's it and and. And illusionist allowed me to do that for you know for two years, and then the moment that it come to a point where it, that were changing, we we parted company. Do you do you feel that um, you got to a point where I d I don't want this to come across badly. Uh, do, do you feel that you got to a point where working with illusionist was stifling the type of mentalism that you wanted to do, because their base, their their fan base is primarily. People that are very new into magic and mentalism, they probably don't know that much, which is why a Kickstarter campaign works for them, because they're attracting people that don't know a great deal. Whilst, you know, a lot of them, the, you say you love mentalism, which I know that you do. You talk about a book that you've written. That's probably going to be more hardcore mentalism, which probably wouldn't fit with the illusionist brand. So what I mean is, do you think that that was one of the things maybe there's, certain things that you want to explore that wouldn't fit in or be a commercial viable product for illusionist there's a lot of i mean like i say i only i only ever really talk about two percent of my my ideas and and i'm not i sort of treat it like a consultancy position that's the best way to put it i treat it like a consultancy position so i were writing for me if i was not me yeah that's the best way and i wouldn't say it was stifling my creativity but it certainly there was certain restrict, like for example, there's a lot of things that I couldn't focus on because I was spending time focusing on other things. That's probably the best way to put it. 
I wouldn't say that they were ever really stopping me from doing it because I could have done whatever I wanted to do. That's the honesty. And, and, and I know that it would have been, if it were, if I were that passionate about it, they wouldn't have restricted me using the voting system unless they thought it were a really terrible idea. But on the flip side, terrible ideas, I think, sometimes seeped into it because of the voting system. Mm. You know, like, or ideas I wouldn't usually back. Like, you know, but, but no, I, I didn't really feel stifled. I just, but I'm a natural wanderer, you know, like I've, like I've, uh, as a kid, I was the same. Like when, when, when I was younger, the kids would go out for a day and come home at the six week holidays. I'd disappear for two, three weeks at a time. My parents never, well, my nan, my nan never really worried because she'd know that I was safe. Whether I were camping for a week somewhere or staying at a friend's or I just disappear. And I've always been that sort of person. I'm an explorer. So Wherever the wind sort of takes me, I just, I just ride the wave and just see see what happens, and that's and that's re- that's really what it is. It's just just wanting to see where, where where it's going to take me next, and I'm excited for the next chapter. You know, yeah, and we want to talk, I want to talk about that next chapter, but before we do, let's talk about the actual kit, because like it or not, like you say, you've not been with Illusionist for six months. But your name's all over that. Your name's all over the trailer. Your name's all over the box. Your face is on the box. Um, people are going to like buy because it's you. A lot, of the, a lot of the purchasers, I imagine, are people that have bought how to control mines, how to uh, how to read mines. They like your material. Uh, they're fans of yours. That they're, they're getting the new kit. Can we talk about can we talk about the new kit for a bit? Because I know that you said yeah, you, you don't know everything about it, but um, there seems to be. I don't know why. Um, compared to the other kits that Illusionist have put out, it almost seems to be shrouded in secrecy a bit. Like all the other Kickstarters that I can remember, there's a full breakdown of what you get inside the kit. Like you're going to get this, you're going to get this, you're going to get this. There's not really that sort of discussion i mean people are talking about the rise gimmick which is intriguing everybody um but outside of that we don't really know too much about what we're getting here um is, is that, how how come we it, it was that a conscious decision by illusionists to be more no, no. yeah i think it, i think the honesty is, is because they don't really know what's fully being put in the kit right and that's a it's because a lot of the explanations I've filmed separately to work. I film myself. So so if I'm really honest and I want to be upfront with everybody, is that this is heavy on explanation. So there's a lot of ideas in the explanations. And when I tallied it up, I did like a list. I worked out that there were like probably about 50 effects. Like probably. I'm, I'm, I, I give a, a rounded number. It might be 48, do you know what I mean? But I give a round it. Oh, there might be more. There might be 54, I don't know, right? But in the explanations, I sat and filmed those myself. And I, I'll explain the effect that's in the box, the prop that's in the, the box. But then I'll talk about three or four, five of our ideas that use that prop. Okay. And then I'll say, okay, like, you might not have your prop with you. So here are four or five ideas that you can do if you forget your prop. Right, so so it's, and I don't mind going over what's in the box. I don't mind talking about what's in the box. So there's the rise gimmick. Now, I've had this for about ten years, and that yours, if you buy the kit, it's not going to look like this, right? This is um, this is the one that Mark made me about ten years ago, and it's so badly cut together and put together because we had no idea about the technology. The the one that's being produced, we had one made. Mark had one made. Um, and it were amazing, like it worked so perfectly. And this had been entombed in a white, it'd be a little white block. So the best way to describe this would be, imagine if you took a deck of playing cards that are white like this, and you trimmed off that amount there, and then you slotted this inside it. That's probably the best way to describe it. It's, that, it's a hard thing to describe. But what it allows you to do is a lot of interesting things. Like it's the way that I used it, and I don't mind talking about it is you know i don't know what how you feel about me talking about uh, the, the method behind an effect well, only only magicians watch this ever so it uh, especially the interviews so as long as you're comfortable with it yeah i, I don't so basically if you watch the trailer uh, you watch the performance that went out with the any card at any number 
I thought it was really interesting. By the way, seeing... everybody on the cafe is talking about that. There's so much speculation about that A can on the cafe. They think that something's cut out of the performance, and it's not. The, the entire method is, in fact, in the performance, right? So, so I'll tell you what this does and how that any card at any number worked. I don't mind sharing it with you because you need this gimmick to be able to do it. Yeah. Right? So, so it doesn't matter if I talk about it. And, and all the credits are fully in place. And when I get to what you can, what extra stuff you can do with this, you'll, you'll realize it's such an interesting gimmick. So, so imagine a cleaner version of this. This is the prototype version that I had. Again, I want to say that I can't speak to the quality of the props that they're going to make. I know that this one, I can perform this 15 meters away, right? So I know it'll work 15 meters, which is big. It's a yeah. 15 meters is, is like 100 foot or something. I don't know. I don't even know what it is off the top of my head, but it's, it's a oh. long distance. Not that you'd ever need it to be that distant, but we, we tested it to see. So we had a card case made. So if you imagine like a card case, and again, I don't have a card case here, but I'll hold up a pad to represent a card case. So when you're looking at this, imagine a card box. And because this is seven millimeters deep, we had a false bottom made onto the bottom of a card box. So basically you've got your regular card box and seven millimeters is nothing. It's like, you, if you looked at the box, you'd never be able to tell the difference in size, especially since though you're holding it like this, right? And this then fits inside the false bottom of the box. And then there's a magnet that sits on the bottom of the box. And when you pull the magnet off, this then works. And then you get given a remote and you can then press the button and the box will vibrate, but you can't hear it because when the cards are inside the case, it dampens the sound. Mm. But the beauty of this, it means then this can be put in a wallet. It can be put into your pocket. This will fit into the coin section of your wallet or into the spine of it. So in my wallet, I don't have it with me, but it'll fit down the spine. It would design that size so that it's the smallest it could be, but it has a charging port on it and other things. Now, this is the way that the performance works. So usually, I'll explain it in the stage context because that's where I'm most comfortable performing it. I take this deck of cards and I'm going to throw it out. So everybody's going to be aware that there's a deck of cards coming towards them. One of you is going to catch it. And if you don't feel comfortable participating, throw the deck to somebody else. So the deck gets thrown out and somebody catches it. That person can decide whether they want to keep it or throw it on. Truly is random. And what this does when I press the button is it vibrates. Right, so it's, it's you can set the sensitivity of the vibration as well. There's, there is a little dial on it, but I won't recommend messing with it. It's set at the perfect level. Like the ones that Mark made me were set at a perfect level. The deck gets thrown out, and I say, now this is not the impressive part of this. In a moment, I'm going to send to you the value of a playing card. I'm going to tell you of it without saying a word. Now, some people say that this feels like electrical energy. Other people say it feels like a psychic vibration. And some people feel nothing at all. So what I'm doing is I'm priming the spectator to know that they're going to be feeling something. And I said, all you've got to do is use your feelings to build up a playing card. So let's test this. So I say, close your eyes for me. So they close their eyes. And I hold up three fingers. Now, obviously, in the any card at any number performance, I've stripped this bit out because it's pretty obvious when you hold the box exactly what you're supposed to do, right? But I do this on stage. Hold up three fingers, and I show the audience the three fingers. And I put this down and say, now, Craig, keeping your eyes closed, I'm going to transmit to you a number. I'm going to send it to you. And all you've got to do is pick up on it. And I thump you on four. Even though I hold three fingers up, I vibrate the box on four, right? I go one, two, three, four, and I press it. Now, the vibration's not so intense that you're going to go, oh, and freak out but it's something that you're, you're going to feel, but it's not going to be too hard. You're going to know it. And I count up five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Open your eyes. And I say, what number were I telling you? What number were I sending to you? And if you say four to me, that's a great indication that you're following me. But to everybody else now, you go, well, wait a minute. He got the number wrong, so he's not in on this. Right? That's the first little subtlety. And I turn around and I say, you know, I think you'll be, you'll be all right for this. And I say it like that, almost like the audience now know this were close for you. I think you'll be all right for this, right? And I say, so we're going to build up a playing card. Now they're holding the box. So it's isolated from me. All you've got to do is use those same feelings to build up a card. So this could be a red card and I press the button, or it could be a black card. Like let's say it's the Jack Hearts. This could be a club, a heart, a spade, or a diamond. I just press it on the heart. Now, obviously in a deck of cards, you have picture cards. I press it on number cards and the pictures are like Jack, Queen, and King. 
you built a playing card up there. Now, it's not about me guessing the card, but you're going to tell me what card you built up. What card did you build up? And they said the Jack of Hearts. Now I know if that's worked. Mm. I know that's my indication it's worked. So I've safeguarded myself. So this is what the exact line that I use them. So imagine that I've said to you the Jack of Hearts without saying it. Craig, if you could throw that deck to somebody in this audience, there's obviously 52 cards in the deck, and they could tell us the exact card, the number of cards we had to deal down to arrive at the Jack of Hearts, and they nailed it bang on, would you be impressed? Yes. Right, so they're impressed, right? So now they throw the deck, boom, it lands on somebody. Stand up, join me up here. They join me up on the stage. Now I don't force the number. Right, the way that the deck's created, it's called a Mirage deck. And what that is, is this card would be the Jack of Hearts. The one below it would be a regular card. Then the Jack of Hearts, regular card, Jack of Hearts, regular card. So every odd-numbered card is the Jack of Hearts. But they're not Svengalied, right? So this person's got the box. They've brought the cards up into the performance space. And then I, I open the box. I take them out so they see the first card. I, and then I turn it face down. Now, there's a reason for that. Is the only number they can't name from 1 to 52 is 52, right? So by bringing the cards out face up, it kills two purposes. One, it allows me to flash the face to subtly suggest they're all different, which we're going to then nudge again later in a second. But it also means that they know it's not there, so they're not going to pick 52 because they know they'd be wrong before they started. Mm -hmm. But I say, now I want you to think of a number from 1 to 52. And in a moment, we're going to deal down a number of cards to arrive at the Jack of Hearts. Now, I created that line so ambiguously that that line, we're going to deal down whatever number you name to arrive at the Jack of Hearts. How many cards are we going to have to deal down to arrive there? If they say any odd number, I point to the table and say, we've arrived at this playing card. If you'd have gone one card more, now I could turn the next card over and show it, or one card less, this would have been different. Now I collect the deck up. If they say an even number, then, then what I do is I go, we've dealt down these cards to arrive at this playing card. And I just point to the card in the hand. So it allows me that leverage. And then I go, take that, put it to your chest. Now, if you'd have gone one card more or one card less, and I can show the one card more, one card less, put it back together, put that on the table, say, again, what card are we looking for? They say the Jack of Hearts. If this were the Jack of Hearts, it'd be incredible, right? Turn it around and show everybody. So now they've seen this first card. They've seen what the next card in the card before would be. And for the person that caught the deck, that's a card at number. For the 99 other people, whoever you put 90% of the or 99% of the audience, it's an any card at any number. Right? That is amazing. That is, that is I mean, that that is a perfect example of dual reality done correctly. I mean, that's just great. And the beauty is, is that I'm saying the reason that people don't feel the need to talk is because I'm saying openly, this is not the impressive part. I'm going to send a playing card to you without saying a word. I'm going to tell you it without saying anything. And when I transmit this to you, some people say it feels like an electrical sensation. Other people say it's a psychic vibration. Some people feel nothing at all. So, so I'm priming them, but I'm saying this is not the impressive part. I'm telling you this without saying a word. So I'm very open with the fact. So then you, you're sat there and go, yeah, he's told everybody that he's telling me this card. So you don't feel the need to, to mention it, right? And, and when I were on Fremont Street, one of the things that I were doing, and I thought this were great, is when I found a couple that were on a first date, I'd, I'd grab this couple and I'd say, you're out on a date, you're out on the first date, or they're a married couple. And I'd say, would you mind putting your relationship to the test? And they say, <laughs> not all. And I'd say, right. You're going to pick a card. It could be any card in the deck. You're going to guess it. I'm going to teach you what you need to do to be able to read your partner, right? So now I'd force whatever playing card. I'd let, or I'd let them pick them. They're a mark deck. They could pick any playing card. It didn't matter. And now what I'd do is I'd lean into to the partner and I'd say, I'm going to be really honest. You don't have a cat's chance in hell of guessing this without me telling you. So in a moment, the cards are going to be in the case. And I'm literally going to read that person and give you the answer and let you take the credit. And all you've got to do is whenever you feel it, just go with your feelings. You'll understand what I mean. So now I'd lean out, right? And, I, and literally I'd say, now I obviously don't know what that card is. So just imagine sending it to me and sending it to your partner. And now I thump them on the right card. Now this person can never expose the fact that they've been thumped because to do that, they have to, they have to kill the fact that they're on a first date, right? So... But also, let's say that they did, 
Right? And this is a bit where people really need to understand these type of routines. Let's say that they did. And they go, no, no, you were just giving me the answer. You were telling me it. Well, how did I know the answer in the first place? So the power is never taken away from you as a performer. You still had to read that person to give that person the information. So even at, at worst, somebody, and on a first date, somebody's not, or even married couples and not, they're going to keep that secret to themselves because it were to test the relationship. But if they do expose the secret and they go, yeah, he was just telling me, he was just cueing me. Well, then how did he know it? You still get the credit for reading the person. So you, so it's never really, a, it's ne it doesn't matter if they talk, you're still getting 100% of the credit, right? And so this device allows you to take your best friend into a bar and it allows you to put that in their pocket and turn them into the second part of your two-person telepathy act. We know practice. This, this device will also, if you perform lift, you could perform lift from the other side of a room whilst the person's got their eyes closed and get them to do things using this instead of the, the other methods that are used. And that's what this device were designed for, right? It was designed for me to, at a distance, be able to turn somebody that I'd just taken, or even just a bit of fun where I bring somebody out of the audience. I mean, let, let me give you two examples that are on the set so that anybody sits here and goes, oh, yeah, but you're just instant stooging the person. Everybody, the amount of people that don't realize how powerful a technique like that is, if it's framed correctly, mm. right? Like, like if I, imagine I talk about a, a parlor psychic that used to travel from parlor house to parlor house named Frida Roundtree. And this is a true story. Uh, and Frida was so good at what she did that she literally fooled the medical community and she'd go and she'd visit doctors and scientists and she'd fool them. They'd talk about her at a town hall and then she'd have a sellout audience because people from every single town had come to watch the marvels that she, she portrayed on stage. And skeptics, no matter how hard they tried, couldn't figure out how she was doing what she was doing. And her family were hounded so badly that they distanced themselves from their own mother because they didn't want to be part of it. So to keep her family from being attacked on her deathbed, she come out and she said she were a fraud. She never exposed how she did what she did. But I read some papers that taught me the techniques that Frida were using, these fraudulent psychic techniques to make it look like she were doing these incredible things. And I wonder if those techniques had still fooled the modern day audience. So can I have somebody come out of the audience to help me out? And we're going to use these fraudulent psychic techniques to see if we can fool a room full of people that do know better than the people of the SDE, right? So now when you bring the person out of the audience, if they go back and go, oh, yeah, we're using this technique to tell me to the one person that's their friend. Well, you've stated that openly. You're using the techniques of a fraudulent psychic and, you, and they still don't know how you know the information. So there's still a piece of the puzzle missing where they're like, yeah, but I still don't guess, get how he managed to read the person. So yeah. every, everything's a tool, right? Everything's a tool. And, and this allows for so many uses from turning a friend who's one of your friends into a two-person telepathy act where you need to expose nothing. Like you could do fake contact mind reading with this where there's four objects on a table and you close your eyes like this. You've got the device in your pocket your friend, so somebody touches an object on the table, you open your eyes and you say, right, take my wrists and I'm going to use what they call contact mind reading. And the moment you get over the top of the right object, your friend just punches it and lets you know which one it is. Like there's a, you, let's say it's a name in the alphabet. I mean, this is a bit of a long-winded thing, but let's imagine it's a name in the alphabet and you went through A, B, C, D. Your friend could punch you into the right letter. Okay, I don't know what letter it was, but they've punched you in on P. Think of the amount of letters in the name. So it could be one, two, three, four, five. P punches you into where it is. So now you know it begins with a P. You know whether it's a male or female. You know how many letters it is. You can pretty much guess the name somebody's thinking of without ever having to peek it because your friend can just pun give you it from this little device. If you're working on your own, the applications are unlimited. You, you know, so, so the device itself is that like for years has been something that's really, I've used it in the real world for years. In corporate settings, I carry this in my bag, right? I'm doing, I'm down in London doing a corporate on the 15th. I don't do very many corporates. I'm very honest about it. But the amount of times that the CEO of a company or a manager will come up to me and say, you know, is there any way you can make it seem like I'm reading the staff's minds so that they think that I know them that well? <laughs> and I go, I, I go, look, to be honest with you, I don't re really usually do that because it takes a long time to train somebody. Let me have a think about it for a minute. And you go, do you know what? I've got it. I'm going to give you this. 
and I'll read the person. I'll read their mind and I'll just feed you the information without knowing them knowing that I am. And you can take all the credit for it. So now to expose themselves, they have to say they don't know their staff that well. And even if they don't, you go, look, it takes years in their head. The manager leaves thinking, oh, it takes years to train somebody to read somebody else. And he's he's genuinely still read them. So you've never negated anything that you said you not that you're still entertained. You've still read people. And it's the way that it's framed. But this device is like, I love it. Like it, like it. So I really feel passionately about that. That's the rise gimmick. I just told you how the any card at any number worked on the video. I don't mind exposing that and sharing it. Like it, like I'm not here to I'm not here to claim that it's the burglass effect. And when and when somebody said, oh, it's the closest thing to the burglass effect. Look, let me be honest. Like, and I don't, and I'm not taking any anything away from burglass. If I wanted to perform the burglass effect, I could do that with a borrowed deck of cards. You've seen me in London yeah. doing it. Like I borrow a deck of I, cards. You multiple times doing that, yeah. Yeah, I, I can do it. So I don't need this gimmick to do that. Like I can literally just, I can do it, right? And I have a method to do it. But this allows somebody who's never done it before to do it. If you're not a fan of any card at any number, put this in your wallet, turn you and your partner or you and your friend into a two-person telepathy act, make a, you know, be able to do contact mind reading, be able to guess what, the, the, the limitations of this are only bound by your own imagination. Like, so for the set, when I say that it's worth it for this alone, like it is, it's like if they produce it right, like I literally, if they produce it right and I got to sign off on it, which I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to be able to, I don't think I'm going to be able to, but if they do, I'd wholeheartedly back anybody, like back it 100% and say for 100, however much the set is, maybe $100, I don't even know how much it is, but it's an electronic gimmick. And you're yeah. getting you're getting all the explanations of all the different ways that you can use this one thing alone, and that's one prop. When you look Did at I, it, I mean, it's it's yeah. When you look at it that way, it's like a no brainer. Well, but you know, a lot of people were complaining that the set were too expensive, but when you break it down, it's ex it's expensive when you think of it on mass because it's a box. But let's say that there is fifty effects in there, and I, like I said, I'm just rounding up. So don't co don't sit there and count them all and go there's. 47 effects, Pete lied to us. I don't know if that's, I just rounded up to what, what were the closest number. But if you work it out like that and it is $100, then that means that every effect in there you're getting for $2. But then on top of that, you're getting a box, you're getting an electronic gimmick, and then you're getting the rest of the props that are in there as well. When you look at it like that, $2 per effect, plus the prop to perform it, and then the out if you don't have it and still perform the same thing, like the value of the the, the box, I think is great. Like I don't think there's anything wrong with a box. And I wish, I wish they'd have just had me do a video that want a fancy trailer or put me in the Kickstarter, just telling you what's in the box, because because some of the stuff in there is, is great stuff. But on the flip side of that, you know, like this, when you watch me do the performances with this, I'll be all right. They'll be good. Some of the stuff you're watching me perform for the first time. That's the bit that I feel a bit uneasy about. And I understand that. And I mean, that must have been a, a difficult situation to be in as a performer that cares about his performances so much to have to go out and literally having never seen a prop before and then having to go out and do live performances with it. That's hard, right? It was horrible. Like, like, and I'm, I, like I back 100% the explanations on the set. Like wholeheartedly stand behind them. For somebody who's a, a beginner to magic and mentalism, it might be difficult to find the gems because you have to really listen to the explanations. The performances, there was supposed to be another set of performance dates that were booked in. And the footage that I captured on that first couple of nights were just supposed to be that, just for me to review. And then obviously we parted company in between that. Now I'm not for a second, I mean, you saw the performance on Fremont of the Any Card at Any Number, that were all right. And maybe I'm being a bit harsh on myself. But for whatever reason, I was supposed to have the props a long time before the box came and I didn't get them till I got to Vegas. And none of us knew that I were going to be leaving the company or that I'd be parting ways with the company. So when you're watching the performances, it could be taken as a positive and a negative. If you, if you want to look at it as a negative, you can look at it and say, oh, like, you know, like he's not performed with these, so who's he to tell us about these ideas? Da, 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 da. Or you can look at it as though, well, wait a minute, if this is the results that Pete's getting, having performed them once, yeah, you know, the performances were, I bungled my way through a lot of them. 
But I'm honest about it. I hold my hands up and say, look, like some of them, I, I just, I'm just not winging it. It's the wrong word. I had an idea. But like when we went into the bar with the dollar bills all around, like you notice that I give the woman a, a bulldog clip. Yes. You know, and, and I watched one of the review channels and they were like, oh, there's no way that the prediction can look this clean. There's no way. He has to handle it. Yeah, you have to take it out of the clip. But anybody that knows the Austin clip knows that they can literally name anything in the world. And then it's going to be what comes out of the clip, right? It's, but the way that I handle that on the set is two ways, and I don't mind talking about it again. The problem with the Austin clip, and so the original Austin clip, it was released by a guy called Bob Austin, and I believe it was 1954. I might be wrong, but but I do talk about the credits on there. Um, a lot of performers have designed them, and I actually went to Etienne Pradier, and I and I wasn't the person that picked the clip. I, Mark and I discussed the clip, and, and we give them a range of objects that they could pick, and they picked the clip. They voted the clip in. I personally went up to Etienne Pradier at the Leeds Magic Jam, and I said, look, they want to put a, a, a bulldog clip in the box. I know you've got a bulldog clip. I know that you know people, when they think of it, they think about you. I don't want to offend you in any way, shape, or form. If you say to me, no, I'll pull it. Do I have your blessing to to put it in there and Etienne being the gent he is said oh of course put it in you know like the, the most incredible guy said put it in so every everything that you see in the box have got the relevant permissions you know there's there's an any card any number that were donated by Andrew Gerard if you don't know who Andrew Gerard is I'd consider him one of the best mentalists in the world one of the best creators his mind is phenomenal and he gifted me the any card any number uh, no sorry the out of this world to put in there Mick Clark gifted me memory shuffle which is an effect that's years old, but with my little touches in the explanations, like that, I talked to you. Come out as a performance on the socials for your illusionist, and it's blown everyone's mind. And the ending of that, there's a better ending. So that's version, that's the ending for version one. At the end of that, when you get down to the spades and diamonds, I literally share away, I don't have a performance of it, and I'll explain why in a moment, but I share away where you've done the hearts, you've done the clubs. The spades and the diamonds, you can hand to a spectator, showing them the mixed cards, give them a legitimate shuffle, put them together and have them do a perfect out of this world with the spades and diamonds as the kicker to the back end. It's like a beautiful piece of magic. It's a beautiful piece of mentalism. And, and then there's an out of this world that's done over the telephone. Like you see it in the trailer done, and I can literally tell you what cards, black or, black or red in your hand. And it's an old concept. And then I put the kicker on the end. Do you know what I mean? And I talk about, and then I feather in the sneak thief peak for being able to do it with a borrowed deck of cards at any moment. So it's like, it's like there's, for me, that there's a lot on the explanations. If you're looking for, are going to be incredible. If you don't look for them, then, you know, like, like maybe the performances are going to be seen as, as weak. I don't know. I can't comment because I haven't seen them. I filmed them and I have, I can't remember, I can't remember what they are. But, I, I wish that people watching it know that I, I got the props for the first time. You're watching me perform them for the first time. If they're the results that I'm getting with these props, having touched them for the first time with practice, you should be able to see the results that you get. Do you know what I mean? Like that, I think, so it's a positive or a negative, but I really don't want people to punish me for the quality control or the R and D. And I don't want people to punish me for, or for like think any less of me because of the performances. I'm not. I, I'm not saying they're going to be bad. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. I don't. They, they, they're literally. They're choosing what performances get to be aired from the first time of me ever having performed these, and it's a voting system. So that's down to them. Maybe I'll get a say. Maybe I won't. I don't know. But if you want to know what else is inside the box, there is. Um, there's the rise gimmick. There is the Austin clip, which again is a beautiful piece. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a fantasy in flames roulette that I put as a precursor to the the bulldog introducing the bulldog clip. I talk about like Turville. So like, a, like um, I talk about Turville as well, which is a way to get the, the participant to write what goes on the inside of the bulldog clip. Wow. So, so it's, you know, they're writing it without knowing they, they, they don't know they're writing the prediction. And the beauty is using the Turville principle, the audience don't know that person's handwriting. So I say, you keep track of everything because maybe, you know, I don't want to forget anything. You tally everything up. It gets folded 
I do, a, I pretend I say, right, we've got that, that'll stay there. I do a dummy switch out that's on the table. Now, when I go take out what's out of the bulldog clip, I give it to them. Can you read aloud what's inside there? This person's reading that person's handwriting. They don't know that person's handwriting, so assume it's your handwriting. And now you've never had to write anything and you've got your spectator being your assistant without them ever knowing that they have, right? So so there's a lot of really decent stuff. There's a there's the two a two out envelope that I put out in Bigger Fish, the original two out envelopes. And I've used I've look, when I consulted on Axe, like got talent axe, we've used those. So they're powerful there in there. Uh, there's a shiner in there, which is like, you know, I mean, a sh let's be realistic about something. A shiner is just a shiner, but it's a forgotten tool. It's like this in, in the How to Read Minds 1 kit, there was a Swami gimmick. I'd liken the shiner to a sw Swami gimmick. It's an incredible tool that you can have that you can carry in your wallet that's just a bit bigger than a coin. And what I do, I play I play a psychic. Uh, do you remember the game Psychic Detective? Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a party game where you write the name of a celebrity on a post-it note and stick it on your head. Yeah, I remember that. So so what better justification for having somebody write down the name of a celebrity and they've got a celebrity on their head, you give them the chance of three... And as you put the post-it note onto their head, the, the celebrity that you've written, to give them a chance to guess it, you've got the shiner in your hand that's looking at what they've wrote on your head. Oh, that's just brilliant. Like... <laughs> And you're, you're right, the Shiner is something that has been around forever and nobody does anything with it. That's it, and it's, I'm not here to say, look, oh, don't get me wrong, look, the honesty is that you could go to Amazon and you could probably buy a Bulldog clip, but we're going to show you what ingredients you need to be able to make a Bulldog clip yourself, then how to do a roulette routine with Bulldog clips, then all the additional information about getting a spectator to write it, then uses for it like billet switches and stuff that are not that just in case you forget your clip a way to do the same thing if someone says oh show me that prediction thing then you've got this that you could do all that stuff with then i talk about the two out envelopes with the di divination systems and stuff you can use in ways with the two out envelopes that you won't think about and then rejuvenating this you could go and buy a compact but you could go and find somebody that's got a compact makeup mirror and pull it out i'm not saying that you couldn't but but if you're looking at it solely just for that prop I mean, obviously, the rise gimmick's the thing that's carrying the box. That's yeah. that's the honesty. It's carrying the but box. From what, yeah, from what you've told us about that, that rise gimmick could be a hundred pound product on its own. That's what I'm saying. So, so like I'd back that one thousand percent. Yes, you could get a compact makeup mirror, but the explanations that I'm giving you for every single one of those, if you're only paying two dollars a piece, and you're getting the mirror, so you'd have to order the mirror and mess about taking it out yourself. I just think that I think that it's worth what it is. And in the explanations, if if you get those, they really are strong. They really, really are strong. But the spider pen, I don't like. I'm not a fan of the spider pen. That's the thing that I've had a lot of people talk to me about and say, oh, you know, what is it? It doesn't appear to be a mentalism style product. I don't really know what the spider pen is, to be honest. I just know I've heard people talk about it negatively. So, so, the, so in a nutshell, this is where it is, and I'll show, I'll show you it, right? So, not the spider pen, but I'll show you what it looked like. Now, of course, you know what the outcome of this is, so it wouldn't work the same way. But I'll show you how it'd look. This is how, this is how clean it'd look, right? So, I give somebody a pen. So they get given. I don't like the spider pen. I'm precursoring this with I don't like it. I give somebody the pen, the sharpie, and I give somebody a pad or a stack of billets. This is literally what the routine looks like. There are two versions, one's psychological, one's mechanical. So, Craig, how good would you say your memory is? That's all right. It's not bad. So I'm going to name some categories, and I just want you to remember them. That's it. Okay. So it could be places, insects, times, names, numbers, letters, or brands. And now the person names insects as the category, right? So they name it. And then I say name like a... Oh, no, I say think of one of those categories. So they do, right? And I have a way to, to whittle it down. And what I do is then I get them to think of spiders. So they think of spider and I say, right. In fact, what I want you to do is just write this down so we don't forget it. And the moment they say spider, they pull the cap off the pen, the spider jumps out the pen. That's it, right? I don't like the pen. I like the, I use, I've used the force for years. Normally I write the word spider and I place it face down and I psychologically influence you to go for a spider. That's okay. usually how it's done, right? And then I turn it over and it's like, fuck, how do we know that? But there is mechanical versions in there where you use the billets that are provided to you use the billets that are provided in there to force a spider if you wanted to do it. And 
you know, like I, I, it's just a prop that was voted in that is not my style. But one thing that I were told when they were voting this prop in is that I, I'm, you know, like I'm not the audience that they're selling to. And if those audience members like the spider pen and they're coming in from magic, then, you know, that's that. It's, yeah. It's, you know, it's not down to me. So I don't like the spider pen. I'm very open about that. Um, yeah. I also state a number of times on the project, look, and I stated it, I think, in Kevin Booth's comments, that for $100, you can buy a lot of books. But I can tell you that, yeah. that in, in, when you go buy those books, I've taken the time to read those books, and I've had to buy a lot of books and read a lot of books. I've taken the time to reach out to Andrew Gerard. I've taken the time to reach out to people like Mick Clark, Etienne Pradier. I've taken the time to talk to people about the two-hour envelopes, I've created the interesting plots and done the research so you don't have to. So, so yeah, like, I'm not here to say that the, all the concepts, like, for example, Turville's not my concept. They were released in the Jinx. You know, it's not my concept, but it's in there. The Bulldog Clips, not my concept. It's, it's Bob Austin's concept. But I've done the research and added my own stuff to it. And then, I, you know, and, we, and, I, and it's all about showing people the classics. Wow. <laughs> so it's sounds, it. I, mean, I suppose the one question I've got is if Illusionist asked you to film more performances, would you? Because it seems from speaking to you that the the thing that really grinds your gears a little bit is that you didn't get the level of performances that you wanted to because you left the company before it was completely finished. I would, and if anybody from Illusionist is watching this and wants to send me out on a couple of days, I, I won't expect you to to pay me. Just pay for the expenses, and I'll go do the performances. That's great. Like, like, like I don't think it can be any fairer than that. But, but it can't be any fairer than that, and that would make it a much better product. I mean, it already sounds like it's going to be really good. I can't see why Illusionist wouldn't want to do that. I, I'm I, like I don't know. I mean, I can't I can't speak for what. What they want to do maybe they've already invested so much money into it that it's not financially feasible i, I don't know i don't know how it all works like I, I can look at the the demographics of people that are looking at that stuff but i don't know what they're making financially off the back of something like that yeah yeah so wow okay i i to be honest i had no intention of buying that thing but i think you've just converted me if only for the rise gimmick alone it it, it i i could see so much potential for that. If if it's produced right, like it's worth the, the price of the kit. Like like there's you could have so much fun with it. And I have done like the amount of times where I've been to, at conventions, you know, like when when I'm in a pickle and I like Mark will literally put it in my pocket and he sits on another table and <laughs> he can give me stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like there's just I've just had so much fun with it over 10 years. Like my, my favorite ones when Mark's ordering a drink at the bar. And somebody's punching their their numbers into a pin pad. Do you know what I mean? And they'll they'll thump me the numbers before they get back. And then they come and sit down. And I say, "Oh, can I show you something I'm working on?" And I just nail their pin code out of the blue. And Mark's still at the bar, so there's no way he could have told me it. You know, like I love little things like that, where tiny little things where it's just fun. Like, and there's so much you can do with it. But but yeah, it is it is worth it. Um, there's one thing I do want to press that I think is really important is I, I seem to be taking a lot of flack online at the moment for promising 12 months of the Royal Road to Mentalism series. I was actually going to bring that up because, you know, you brought up Mark's name. Uh, if people don't know who we're talking about, we're talking about Mark Lemon. Um, and, yeah, a few people have been talking about... Uh, the Of course, for, to give people context, Illusionists were releasing through their online streaming platform, weren't they? Uh episodes of the Royal Road to Mentalism. Do you want to talk about about that? Because obviously no yeah, new well, come out for the a while. reason I bring it up is the reason I bring it up is because it leads me into another subject as well about some idiot that uh, recently called me out on YouTube. And I don't normally address stuff like this, but when it when it's regarding Theodore Anneman, like that's one artist that you like I my life changed because of Theodore Anneman. Like everything that I have and everything that I am now is because of that man's teachings. Like and I, and there's nobody that I'd hold in higher regard than Theodore Anneman. And I know a lot of things about Theodore Anneman that, that most people would never know. 
you you named your child after Theodore. Ayman. Yeah, my, my my son's called Theodore, um, and so this guy he, he runs a, a magic show. It should be called Bias Magic Reviews, um, but you know, like goes I've on. Had, that, I've had run-ins with him in the past, Pete. Yeah. So is I don't I, I don't normally bring something like this up, but he's one of the people that are complaining online and the comments seem to be a little echo chamber of people that want to voice the same opinions. I'm ripping people off. I mean, he made out like I was charging hundreds of dollars for the let me tell you something. I never made anything from the Royal Road to Mentalism. I did that out of out of work hours, just as a, whenever I met Mark, we'd sit down and I did that in my own time. And I never made an extra penny. I wanted my job description to do that. I'd have made my salary regardless of whether I did that or not. So I did that because I wanted to do it. And I did it because I love the book, Royal Road to Card Magic. And I love the other things that it inspired outside of that. And so I'll address that first because I'm, I'm no doubt that he'll probably be watching this video. And if he wants to give me a public response that he can, but um, my next response back will, is not going to be so polite because people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. And I hope he understands what I mean by that. But he claimed that I'd uh, literally stolen the idea off Anaman and that I'd made no changes. I'd not credited Anaman in any way, shape or form. I made out like it were my idea. And then that I'd not added anything to it. The first three minutes of the explanations, I lift up a book that were produced by Burling Hull. There's an Anaman book. I lift the book up and I say, if you want to find this effect, you can find it inside this book. And I give people a resource to go find a version of it from a legitimate site for, for pennies. No, he never pointed or nodded towards it. But here's here's what's important. That effect were not created by Anaman. It was created in 1909, and it was put out in a book called uh, The Art of Magic. And it was by an unknown creator. And that were Anaman's presentational hook for that effect. So when I say in the explanations that I've taken a presentational hook from this book and added my own touches to it, that's the truth. Like, I'm not going to, you know, Anaman never claimed it was his idea. I know whose idea it is because every idea that I've ever looked back at, I've done my own work on. But because the unknown artist contributed the idea first and Anaman were the first place that I'd read it before doing my research, I referenced Anaman's work and I sent people towards Anaman. I'd never steal from Anaman. And then when, it, when I took the idea and I made the changes that I made, adding my own touches, I talked about doing it on billets with drawings and then using white gel pens to make the one-way marking systems. That's enough of an update to say that, look, I, I'm, I'm releasing this with a nod towards Anaman and a nod towards Ginu Guard from Royal Road to Card Magic. And then he come back at me in the comments and said, you tell me where the one-way backmarking systems found in Royal Road to Card Magic. I'd love to hear it. So if you want a public answer to that, because this is probably going to get more views than his, than his video, the public answer to that is really simple. If you've watched the series, you'll know that I say it could be a sentence, it could be a word, it could be a principle, it could be a shuffle that inspires the topic for that episode. In episode three, there's an, a topic that's about whispers and a comedic whisper is mentioned in Royal Road to Card Magic. That's not an effect. It's a fleeting moment. There's nothing to do with the effect. It's just a comedic moment. Yeah, it inspired an entire section of whispers. And I went outside of Royal Road to Mentalism and did my research and brought in things from outside of Royal Road to, sorry, Royal Road to Card Magic into Royal Road to Card Magic, mixed with my own principles to create that episode. I, I initially wanted to do something on topsy-turvy cards which is this idea that you take cards and you reverse them. Yeah. And we more affectionately know that as a slop shuffle, right? But when I was designing ideas, I put a pin in it and I put your reverse cards to the point they're seemingly mixed up. And I couldn't figure out anything that I thought were interesting enough to share. So when I punched at my notes, reverse cards, the Anaman idea came up. And then I brought ideas from Anaman and the Art of Magic into the what had been inspired by the effect that were inside Royal Road to Mentalism. So yes, one-way markings and one-way back designs weren't mentioned in Royal Road to Card Magic, but had I not read Topsy Turvy cards and I'd not read the idea of reversing cards, I wouldn't have punched that into my notes, which then inspired me to go back to something I'd read of Anamans and re reference a presentational hook that he borrowed from the Art of Magic. Never stole from Anaman. The entire series 
The literal trailer for the series is about taking a look back into the past at giants that came before us and expanding upon the great work that those people have done with references to external links where you could read this stuff yourself. I always do that. What did I just say a minute ago? Upon Cave and Boost comments, you could buy a lot of books for $100. When you're yeah. watching this stuff, it's I've done the research for you and I've made the changes to modernise the stuff that you might not be able to do yourself. You're like, I'm not claiming... absolutely so shit hot on crediting. I know you are. I've spoken to you so many times and seen so many of your projects where you go above and beyond compared to other people. I mean... Well, if you look at Attic Salt, go to Attic Salt. I mean, I don't mean to reference it again, but there's a full credits and inspiration section in the back and ideas that date right back to the early 1800s with credits that, that go beyond what's put on Conjuring Archives. Like, I literally always go out of my way to credit. And, and I've said to you before, like, like I, I have asked you, I've openly come and said, look, do you know who the credit is for this shuffle? I can't seem to find it. And, and then what I'll do is I'll credit the best source I can at the time. So if I can't find the original credit, I'll find a credit that closely resembles or matches so that when you go look back at that idea, maybe you'll be able to find where it originally came from. But I'll always credit somebody because nothing I do, and I'll state this very categorically now for anybody watching this, nothing I do ever comes from my head. It always comes from being inspired by something else and then what I add to the top of it. Because I understand that I stand on the shoulders of giants, the greats like Kenton Nepper, Richard Osterlind, Bob Cassidy, Theodore Anneman, Burling Hull, Robert Nelson, Robert A. Nelson, the, the geniuses that come before us, names that people have forgotten about, like Sam Schwartz, I look into and I love, I love talking about their stuff. Chris Wardle, people like that have given me ideas that I'd have never had if I'd have not read their ideas. And then I've ran with them and added my own stuff, taken bits from here, there and everywhere, and then put my twist on them and put them back together. And the end product is something that I'm proud to present. But I never once would have an ego to stand here and say that nothing I've ever done has been steeped in something that somebody else has done before. Because it has. You know, my presentation for PK Touches if somebody like Banachek had not done PK Touches, then I'd have never have come up with a PK Touches of my own. I'm not saying that what my PK Touches looks like Banachek's. I'm not saying it does, but it wouldn't have existed had I not been inspired by something like that. Yeah. So, so for this guy to come out and say that I ripped off who I'd consider my idol, like, and I've, I don't idolize anybody, you know, but this guy is, he changed my life and his philosophies got me off off of a life of fighting and a, a life of struggling and hustling and a life of doing things that I probably shouldn't do, it got me it got me out of the gutter. And to 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 try and say that I'm spitting in that man's face and and not not crediting him when I'm the biggest advocate for him, I thought it were a bit of a slap in the chops. And so you know, it spoke more about the integrity of his review channel. He um, he for somebody who refers to himself as unbiased. There's a lot of bias going on. Uh, yeah, I, I, I could, I could say a lot about that guy. To be perfectly honest, a lot. But, but he, you know, I, I just don't get it. It's like, it's like, look, I'm not, I'm not claiming to be something that I'm not. I know what I am, and I know what my limitations are, and and all I ever want to do is whatever those limitations are, smash them down and move on to the next chapter. Smash them, and I only do that by going into the past so that I can move forwards. And I'm very open about it. If these people didn't exist, then I wouldn't be half the person that I am, even in my life outside of mentalism. But but I, th I always just think it's a bit rude when somebody extrapolates a sentence and takes it out of context and then claims that that's unbiased. I don't think that's very fair. And 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 people like that shouldn't be reviewing stuff. I don't think that they, they should be reviewing stuff because the problem is, let's say that there's 100 people that don't buy the product but watch that video there's 100 people then that think that I've stolen something from somebody that I'd never steal from. And if it had been anybody else, if it had mentioned any other name, I'd have just let the video go on by and I'd have let it go, but I, could, I couldn't. So, so to answer your question, because this is the reason for mentioning it, somebody in the comments mentioned, oh, yeah, and we paid for a year up front and he's not delivered the goods. No, I finished filming the, that stuff six months ago. I filmed all of it. I didn't have to film it. 
I'd left the company when it came to the end of filming the last five episodes. And I went out of my way in my time outside of leaving the company to finish that because that were a promise that I made whilst I were part of the company. Mm. And that and and stuff like that, you know. So you can you've got my word on it that that were filmed. Whether that that's released, whether that's something that's put out monthly as it were promised, that's not down to me. I, I'm not the person that uploads the projects. I'm not the pe- person or people that put it on the site. I'm not the person that that deals with the back end of that sort of stuff. And so just know that I filmed it. I filmed it months and months ago. There's some really nice little bits in there. I, you know, I went out, like I said, I went out of my way to do it in my own time. Uh, but, I, but I won't be the brunt of being attacked for something that I've done. I'm not the one editing it. I'm not the one putting it out. Wow. But it's there, it's done. So at some point, we just got to cross our fingers and hope illusionists don't bring it out. Yeah, I think they will. I don't. I have no doubt that they will. And I don't want people to think that they won't. But there's a few, you know, I don't want people to think, oh, this is a stark contrast to the last video you had. Because I've said, you know, very openly, I have no ill feelings towards illusionist. I don't really know the reason. I can't give you a really solid reason why we parted company other than the fact that we probably just wanted different things. The box, I'm really proud of some of the stuff in the explanations. I'm proud of most of the props. I'm not a fan of the spider pen, but that wasn't mine. It was voted in. Um, you know, it were, it were created as a, as a gag and somebody said that it would be good. I don't know what the quality of the props are going to be like because I'm not part of the r and I've not been part of editing the trailer. I've not been part of any of that process. The how to uh, the, so the Royal Road to Mentalism stuff, I don't know when that's going to come out. It's nothing to do with me. And, you know, am I ever going to go back and work with Illusionist again? The door's always open. Like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I might have something that they want and if they want it, enough and it works and the deal works and i'd probably i'd probably go back i have no ill feelings towards them but have you got any other questions about illusionist inject you can ask me anything and i'll do my best to give to give an answer wow you mentioned earlier on that you wanted to address something to do with the stack watch yes so i know i made promises when, when i were there that i were going to during covid that i'd go out and i'd film expo- uh, film performances of the stuff for the stack watch um I don't know if that's going to be a possibility. So I want to apologize for saying that. Like at the time, I don't want anybody to think that my intention wasn't to do that. The, I were told at the time, look, like we'll, we'll go out and we'll get these performances. If Illusionist rang me tomorrow and said, do you want to go get these performances? There's a venue in London. We'll send like Dwayne down with the camera, go film some. I'd happily go film them. Like, like it just, it's not something that, that I it's very easy to think that I'd be able to do this off my own back. And it's not that I can't do it off my own back. The honesty is that if I had the time to do it, I'd do it. But I'm working on so much right now. And I've, I've got so I'm almost over a barrel with my time that it's just not feasible for me to be able to do right now. And so, but, but I just want to apologize for making that statement and making that promise. Like I, I did fully intend to, to uphold like my side of that promise and, and for whatever reason, I don't think it's going to be possible. Yeah. Did, did, uh, if you could go back and speak to yourself the day you decided to join Illusionist, knowing everything that's happened over the previous couple of years, you know, because there's been pros and there's been cons, like you said, you managed, you had a salary through COVID, which a lot of magicians and creators wish they had. But then obviously you, there's been elements of certain things that you haven't been too happy with how things have panned out. If you could go back and speak to yourself and say, Hey, this is how it pans out. Do you think you'd still do the same thing again? Do you reckon the pro I'd, pros outweigh? I'd never, I'd never do anything different. I'd never yeah. do. I'd never do anything different. And the reason I'd never do anything different is people. I mean, it's a very easy question to ask on the surface, but you know what my brain's like. So I realize how much of everything else would have to change. And and I can't say my life's bad. Like, yeah, there's a few people that don't like me. Like, I'm not, I aren't doing this to be liked. I aren't, I aren't that self-conscious or underconfident that I need to perform mentalism effects to, to get people to like me. That's never what this were about. Yeah. Right? So So people don't like what I did in that two years. That's fine. Mm. Like, but... I, every time I did something, just know that I always thought 
to do it my way. Like, that's it. Like, I put my heart and soul into it, regardless of whether, like the, the spider watch, let's be real, or the spider pen. And, and I don't know what, I, like, and I want to make another thing clear when I say spider pen, I'm not referring to the Yigel Masika thing. And that's, it's not being called the spider pen. That's just the working title for it in the box. It's not, it's not going to be titled spider pen. It's just what I'm calling it so people know what it is. So, Yigel, if you're watching this, don't worry, it's not being marketed as a spider pen. It's got nothing to do with your release. It's not similar to your release. I just I just had to get that out there. But like that, like, like, look, I performed it. So I compromised. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like I performed it. I did it. Like I just went and did it. So would I normally do that? No. Like, and let's, and let's be real, like, some of the things that were said, if people don't, didn't see that in some of the trailers that I was saying things in jest, do you, you, you know, like, like, come on. When, when I said, oh, I've never, I haven't bought a drink since 2015, I probably shut the camera down and I was the first person to offer a round of drinks. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, like, if people think that that's really my character and that, that I'm really that arrogant that I'd walk into a bar and expect people to buy me my meals and drinks, that's not the case, you know, like it, it's a character. And it's like the best way to look at it is like wrestling. That's what it is, you know, like it's, it's, it's people wanted that, like things to be said. It were a drama that unfolds itself and it, and it's a character. And, and that, like looking back, I'd never change anything because I'm, I, if you'd have asked me a day after on the, on the, if you'd have asked me on an interview the day after I'd said that on that trailer, have you never really bought a drink? I'd be open and say, of course I bought drinks. Do you know what I mean? I'm not like, like I'm not, I'm not, there's not, there's not, there's nothing, I have nothing to hide. Like I have nothing, I have nothing to hide. I, I'm honest about the flaws in things. I'm honest about the blemishes. I'm not above apologizing, like about not being able to get the stack watch performances. Like I'm honest about the fact, look at it this way. Think about this. Whilst I was still working for the company, if you'd have asked me on a live interview, I'd have told you I don't like the spider pen. I've not hidden my feelings towards that. Yeah. Like, I'm not hiding my feelings towards the fact I didn't like the SP cards in the first set. Regardless of whether I'm associated with them or not, I'm not I'm not here to hide and try to snake and sneak around well, stuff. I'll well, tell you. People should look back at the first interview that we did together because that was done in the height of uh covid we we're in the middle of lockdown at the time you were working for illusionist and you you weren't drinking their kool-aid in terms of you you know yeah you, you were saying yeah you work for the company and you were promoting some of their stuff but you were also at the same time pointing out a few things that you didn't like i think yeah, that's look, who you are, look, right? you've had some great in your video the downfall of illusionist you made some great points like the, like the social media at the minute is lacking but that's but that's something that, that only they can change. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, is the company going out of business? Like, my personal opinion is probably not. Like, there's always, there's always, there's a million magicians out there. Do you know what I mean? Like they they they'll just they can go back into default. If they wanted, I think if they really wanted Daniel Madison back, they could probably they could probably get him back. If they want Justin Miller, they'll get Justin Miller. If they want anybody. Like there's a lot of people that do say a lot of bad stuff about illusionist, but if the money's right, those people would go there. Mm -hmm. Like so, it's so. I mean, like they don't have a face for the company, which I think is a mistake. But I'm not saying that that face should be me. Do you understand? Like I'm not. I think you were right well, in saying. We're now going into a period of time where, for the first time ever, with you walking out the door, they don't have a face of the company. I don't know whether that makes them... I don't know... Like, the honesty is, I don't know whether that makes them look like they're weaker. I don't know. Because I don't know... I never really thought that my role there were that important. I just thought I'm just a guy that's coming in, I'm doing mentalism, that's it. Like, yeah, and they put me on things. But it, but it, looking at comments and seeing that people are there saying, oh, I only bought stuff there because Pete were there and... You know, it's. I think they made a mistake getting rid of him, and it's very nice to hear that. Like that's the side of sort I do like to hear, but I don't know. Does the company need a face? Is it going to be financially feasible for them to? Are they going to be better off because they don't have a face? I don't know. Like these are all things that I don't care enough about money and the company. They are the only company that had that kind of face. They've always had a face, and nobody else has. Really, I mean, 
you have people that work for the company, you know, like Penguin, you have Eric Tate and, and, and people like that. But the roster of tricks that they have come out and releases they come out changes on a weekly and a monthly basis, you know. So maybe maybe they don't, but I think it, it's something that needs... Well, well think, let, let me... Communicating to their fan base, I think, is, is what... That's what a good way to do it. Well, I mean, let me ask you this question. Let's say, for example, they wanted to find somebody that were edgy somebody that had tattoos and somebody who could do like magic and mentalism that had a good knowledge, who would you put as the face of the company? Um, uh, it's a really difficult question because it's like, it's like the, I think what they've done is they've pigeonholed themselves so much mm. that, that any change that they make is going to be attacked. And that's, and that's like, let's say for example, that they took like the clean cut choir boy looking, but amazing performer. People would say, oh, now they're just trying this as a marketing tactic because they want to get rid of that bad boy image. So they'd get attacked for that. Like, And I'm not saying it's not a fault of their own, but I'm saying like, there's just some some companies and some people that no matter what decision they make, they're backed into a corner and going to be damned if they do and damned if they don't. Mm. And, and, like, and, like, and that's not me sticking up for them. That's just me like looking at it from a... Like, it's so hard. I've sat and thought about it and thought, right, okay, who would fit their MO right now? Like who... Who would go into that company and fit? Yeah. And it's a really difficult thing because there's not that many people. I'm not saying that there's not good performers. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not and I'm not saying that there's not people that are tattooed, but it's like it's a really difficult thing. It's like if you look at the faces, I mean, maybe D. Christopher. Yeah, but he's got his own production company. That's it. So so then so then that ticks him off the list. Louis Laval would be great. Worked with with D. You know, like so it's so it's very slim pickings of people that fit into that role. Yeah. And it, and it, and and that's it. So maybe it's come to the point where maybe it's come to the point where it's just that's why they had to end it yeah, because you think their time. fan base, their customer base, their demographic has changed because of your involvement. Because no, up no. until you being involved in the company. It was Eric Jones, Lloyd Barnes, Adam Wilbur, uh, you know, and before that it was, you know, Madison and Ramsey, and then before that, Miller. The point is, it's always been magic focused and hey, here's this gaff deck, here's this gaff deck, hey, here's this amazing card trick. Hey, and 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 when you came into the company for the first time ever, it became more cerebral. That's when they started bringing out mentalism stuff, and maybe. They've changed their demographic because of your involvement, and maybe they've they've attracted more mentalists. Maybe maybe, like. maybe that's why it's the downfall. Maybe I'm maybe I'm the maybe I'm the maybe I'm the reason <laughs> they tanked. I don't know. I, I'm not saying they've tanked. I'm just saying maybe that's the reason that it's perceived that they've tanked. Um, I don't know. I, I like I don't I don't think the demographic change. The, the honesty is, I've I've seen with my own eyes people on forums say. I'll never buy another thing this person puts out. I hated this and I, da, 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 da. I don't like him. Da, da. And then as soon as something comes out, you see their name click by. So so it's like, it, it, I don't know. I'd, like, do people just, were we? do we have so much pent up rage and so much pent up emotion during COVID that we just needed something to direct it towards? I really don't know why. I mean, I'm not saying that they didn't make certain errors in marketing tactics. We talked about that last time. Yeah, we did. But, but like I don't, I, I don't know. I just think that the people that complain still purchase. Do you know what I mean? So, so if if you really don't like illusionist and you really wanted that company to fall, or you really, and I'm not saying you do because I know that you're an advocate for it succeeding, right? You know what? I would love to see illusionist succeed. I really would. I think that, and I've got all the respect in the world for Brad, uh, for Brad, uh, because. What he did back in the day when he first founded this company was just ballsy, risk-taking. I take my hat off to him, and it worked. And and he changed the game. Uh, I'd love to see Illusionist succeed. I really would. I just think that the flower. So, so would I. Like like I said, they're my friends. So like I'd like to see them strifed. You know, like I'd like to see. And I hope that this perceive. I mean, I'm not saying that they are, they are failing because I don't know enough about the back end to know what they're making, whether they're in pro 
for all we know, they, the reason that they could have sloped off or seemingly sloped off on social media, which we could see the de declining figures, but I'm sure that talking to like Garine, he'd be the first to say, "Yep, we need to do something about social media." He'd be the first to he'd be yeah. the first to admit, like, like I think he'd be the first to say that. But maybe we maybe we're both completely wrong, like about the fact that that because my perception is that that social media has sloped off. I'm not saying for a second that the company's tanking because I don't know what the financial situation is. Maybe the reason for getting rid of Mark and I and a, a few other members of staff is because they wanted to save money. Maybe COVID hit them hard. Maybe, maybe it was the exact opposite. Maybe they had, they've now got so much money that they're like, right, we don't need to really do anything. So let's just sit back for a bit. Mm -hmm. Let's just sit back and let's do nothing. And let's just let every other company think this is happening and then do this you know like like i don't know i mean they, they, they I, I couldn't speak about i couldn't speak about where they're going to end up or what they're going to do i mean i hope i hope that down the line that there's some place for us to do something together like i'd never i'd never say no you know i'd never say no to to most people who ask me if you, i i just love what i do so so at the end of the day any, anywhere that's going to give me a creative outlet to be able to express that as long as as long as they give me the paints and the canvas and say, go do it and don't hold on to the paints and the canvas. And so you can only use a color green and you can only paint on this post-it note, you know, like I'm, I'm open to, and maybe, maybe the output stuff will be different. Um, but like you say, I don't know what, I don't know how much changed because I never, the honesty is, and this is me being real and a true and whether people believe this or not during working at illusionist, I, I never had an account to their website. I've never had an account to their website. I'm not subscribed to their email list. I've never bought one thing from the company in all the time it's been open. So I don't know how much has changed. I didn't see, so I wasn't on the outside looking at it and going, oh, this has changed this much, or on the inside going, look how much I've changed things. I didn't see it, see any change. I just went in, did what I was supposed to do, and then left. And and I don't, and who knows, you know, like, like when, Let's be real about a few things. Like Lloyd is a genius. Adam Wilbur is a genius. Eric Jones, genius. Justin Miller, genius. They've, they've had their fair share of people that know what they're doing. Yeah, and they're all yeah. specialised, you know, they're all specialised in, in their own areas. They're doing their own thing. Like, you know, Daniel Madison, love him or hate him, he knew how to whip up a frenzy. Oh, yeah. How much of that were constructed? I don't know. I I know that there were certain lines and things that I said that were campaigns that were created or aimed, and I'd say, look, I'm definitely not saying that. There were certain things where I'd have to refuse to say because they, because I I knew they'd create controversy. I'm not saying that they were were doing it for the wrong reasons. I don't think their intentions were ever to hurt the customers. I don't think their intentions were to ever annoy people. I mean, it doesn't even make sense from a business perspective that they'd they do anything to damage their customer base. You know, like, unless you've got an idiot that's running the show. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, you know what? I, I, I'm going to say one more thing. I think that one of the biggest problems that Illusionist has at the moment, that I think they can very easily get through past, but they don't seem to, is their lack of communication stroke and or it, I don't want to say honesty because I don't mean honesty, but like I, I just feel sometimes that all of these it's a faceless. They just care faceless. about the, yeah, they just care about getting the money in their pocket. Once they've got it, you're no longer important. And I I know that's not the case, but it feels that way. It's kind of like promising that this Kickstarter is never going to be available anywhere else, and then it's available through all magic dealers at a discounted rate, and it's in a sale, and this and that and the other, and then promising that every single episode of uh, The Royal Road to Mentalism is going to come out, and then it hasn't, and then promising that X amount of stuff is going to be uploaded to their streaming platform, and it doesn't. And then we discussed Back to Black before. I don't need to discuss that or even revisit it, but it's just little things that, that if there were more upfront or just like do, do you know what i mean i think that is a lot of people's biggest issues with what they do it's and, and it's, easy, back it's, it's, it's easy fixed but but i do know on the flip side like and this is me just like playing devil's advocate 
the people that are behind the scenes always used to think about what was best for the customers. And I don't mean in the marketing campaigns. I mean, like, like, oh, we don't want this product because of this, because it's not good enough, or we don't want this because it's this. And so the quality control on stuff were pretty, pretty good. And it were always with a customer in mind. They, they, some of the marketing campaigns didn't go the way they were supposed to go, but you don't know until you try, you know, like, and that's, and that's that. And I think that, I mean, it's no secret now who's the CEO of the company. We mentioned in the comments at your, your last yeah, video. I mean, that's, that's another example though. I mean, uh, just come out and say it you know i mean nobody knew who was running the place for a long time and it was kind of like is brad the guy that's running it is he not there's this that you know g is running it he's the ceo but he made a big deal a few months ago of leaving and then he didn't actually make a thing saying he's come back and now he's running it, it, it you know i mean make him the face of the company make, make you know he's running it Make him the face of the company. He's been on a lot of illusionist products in the past. Is I think I don't know what what the decisions are but with the back end stuff. So I can't really, again. I know I keep saying I can't speak to that. I can have an I can give you an opinion. He genuinely at one point like did leave. Like he and then he got offered a, a job outside for an actual corporate company that's not magic related. And I don't know. I can't say what went on behind the scenes between him and G. All I know is that the next thing. Like it, it were the next thing he was the CEO of the company. And in between that time, like there were a lot of rumors going around, oh, somebody's buying the company. The only people that put an offer in on that company were Mark Lemon and I. That's it. Mark Lemon and I were literally offered to buy the company from Brad. Wow. And Brad and Brad didn't want to didn't want, and that were that were maybe a year ago. So the fact of the matter is that. If Brad didn't want to sell a company to us, I don't think that it's doing as bad as people think it is. When G were leaving, like when G were leaving, like he to Brad, he's Brad, he's Brad's right hand man. You know, like him and Brad are like so when G were going to work for a co Brad were like, Well, I don't know what'll happen. I don't know where we're gonna go, what we're gonna do. So he genuinely was leaving. It's like not that's not a fabricated marketing tactic to Oh, I, I believe that. Like like he he was and then and then all of a sudden, whatever happened behind the scenes, like we we were we. I mean, I don't know whether they took what we were saying seriously, but Mark and I would have done our best. I mean, to get the company, like not because we we wanted the company, it would just be a case of look, there's already a, a client list here. We're already part of it. We already know what little changes we'd make. It were a good fit, and then you know, obviously, our offer were declined, and then. G were CEO of the company, and then that's it. So, you know, he's been in the background doing his thing. But, again, anybody who tries to solely attach the blame to him for anything, there's a voting system that's in place. And, and unfortunately, this is the bit that I never understood, and this is not me giving, like, G and Olive Branch to escape any backlash, is that people were making votes at the company that shouldn't have been making votes, that weren't privy to cr the creative process. So back-end staff made votes on things. Designers made votes on things. And it's like, so when they made votes on things, G would have, I mean, obviously he's been quite, like you say, it's it's been all right for him in the sense that nobody's really known who's running the company or what's happening. But I think it would have been unfair for him to be the face of the company and have to take the brunt of the responsibility of the failures of the voting system. Yeah. Because, because I, you know, like not to, not to stand here and I, I'm trying to stay impartial, like, cause I don't want people thinking that, Oh, he's just his friend. So he's just offending him. There's times where G and I have been at blows over creative stuff. And I'm not hiding that. Like I'm the first person to say, like we've been, we've literally had full blown arguments. And then the, a day later, it's water under the bridge. We move on, you know. Like, like we have we have that relationship that we can do that. And and some of the decisions that are made have they been down to G's responsibility? Yes, they have. Other ones, no, they've not. I couldn't sit here with a tally sheet and go through all of them. And but again, I think that if he had been the face of the company, or if he does become the face of the company, he'd become. I just think that he'd be bullied. 
And I don't think it'd be fair and he'd be a victim of the voting system. Yeah. You know, and so, so, and I, and I won't want to see that. Like, I really won't want to see that. I like, he, for whatever, I'm not saying that the, I don't know what everybody's opinion is on Geraint. Like, and, and the honesty is that this, for what it's worth, I don't care about anybody else's opinion other than the opinion that I form myself. Because I can only judge him based on how he's behaved towards me. And there's been times where, like, for example, and I don't mind mentioning him, and he'll tell you this is the case because we don't hide anything, is, is like they changed the print stock of the version twos of the cross keys deck. And I didn't like it. Like, I didn't like the, I liked the stock that they were on before. And then somebody mentioned the stock in Vegas not being to their liking the same way the first one was. And so, you know, I bit his head off. And I, and the next day I were really apologetic for that. Like, like I were really, but that passion inside me that when I brought up those concerns, he made the decision that we're going to change with Orban and it changed. They're, they're the little differences that we had where I can say, look, that's not my fault. I'd put the blame on you for that. But then there's been other times where other people have made decisions and people have pointed the finger at him and said, that's his fault. And I can scream from the rooftops that it's not his fault. And that happened, you know, look, the black back to black campaign, regardless of what anybody thinks of it, like I sat there behind the scenes and he were pulling his hair out behind the scenes. Like I don't even know the amount of stress that you were going through. And I felt, I did feel so bad for him. I felt it were a shit situation because of the fact that we all had NDAs and we couldn't talk about the situation to defuse it because then we'd be breaching the NDAs and none of us were willing to put ourselves in that position. But you've got to remember that when Brad's attacking somebody, and I don't mean attacking physically, I mean just when he's the, he, he's doing that to G. So G's bearing the brunt of the entire weight of Brad Christian pulling what little hair out that he's got left. Like he's, he's bearing the brunt of that. Do you know what I mean? And then, then he has to come to us and then we're his friends, and he's telling us that we can't say anything because we're breaching an NDA if we do, yet how asking us, how do I defuse this situation? And go, Daddy, genuinely, whether people believe it or not, I don't care. Like, I were there. I've left the company. I have nothing to gain. You've seen how open I've been. Yeah. Go, Daddy dropped, or it might have been Shopify. I don't know if it was Go, Daddy or Shopify, or one of those. They dropped, a, they dropped the ball. Now, you were right in what you said last time, and I did say openly in the last thing, People could have come out and said, look, it'd be fine. But it were only meant to be 24 hours or overnight, and then it'd have been back on the next day. So it'd have only been enough time for people to speculate that something had gone and happened by the time it were back up. And that didn't happen, right? It didn't happen. And I were there behind the scenes watching people panicking, watching people getting chastised, watching the load of stuff that people didn't see happening. And, and, and I see a lot of comments, like the comments in your, some of the threads that you've put about, about him like like some people don't like him but that's that i f almost feel like he's between a rock and a hard place because he can't be your friend like and and at the same time try to run a business do you know what i mean it's like you have to pick one or the other and i think that he gets a lot of stick that he doesn't deserve but at the I, same time i think i think also he makes he does make some decisions that i won't make well, I, I haven't got an opinion on him because I don't know him at, at all. I can't give an opinion on somebody I don't know. Um, so I can only formulate an opinion on what I see. And I can imagine he's got one of the hardest jobs in the world. And I can imagine it's very stressful and it wouldn't be a very easy job to do. And it's not something that I would choose to do. Um, the one thing that I would say is it's a little bit like being a politician in government in the you see a politician bitching and moaning about how hard their job is and you go, well, you chose to be an MP and take that salary. It's true. You it's true. Going, you knew it was going to be a hard job. If you didn't want the stress, go get a job in McDonald's. But, but, you know it's, but also to combat that, I know it's really easy in hindsight for us to like, this is the thing in hindsight, you have 2020 vision. When you're in the, when you're in the midst of a situation like back to black, like that, it's so easy for us to say afterwards what we would do or what we should do because we've learned at the time now how it could be handled. 
in the heat of the moment, one sentence and making one decision can have a catastrophic of, like effect. And 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 what you're doing is you've got the stress of imagine being the person that you've got the stress of like Brad, who's run this company for years, single-handedly blaming you for the way that he's gone. Then you're on the phone to Shopify and they can't get their stuff straight with GoDaddy. Then you know that you've got thousands of customers' credit card numbers that are traveling backwards and forwards ethereally that can't be compromised. And then the license don't come through. And then, then you've got like however many members of staff to direct and say, you can't do this, you can't say this. What should we do in this situation? People are voting behind the scenes. They're all on the phone. This has gone wrong. Then they're saying all this stuff about him online. And then they're saying this about illusionists. Then you're trying to damage. And, and, and you make one decision where you go, look, GoDaddy have told us that it's going to be back up in four to six hours. So let's just ride it out. And in four to six hours, people will know they were wrong. And then 24 hours later, you're like, it's still not come back on. And the pressure's intensified now and you've made your bed and then you make one wrong decision. And that wrong decision is, look, it can't stay like this forever. Let's just ride it out. Right, that's it. That's the wrong decision that he made. One wrong decision in the heat of the moment. And it had hundreds of people foaming at the mouth for his blood. One, And I, I saw on his wall, somebody threatened to get him at a convention and stab him. I saw it on his wall, threatened to stab him. Now that other magic downloads, right? Now that that is not fair. Like, like, and for and 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 don't get me wrong, look, I'm the first person to say when I think he's done something that's wrong. I think that some decisions that he makes are wrong. But I, I want to also say that I think some decisions that I make are wrong. And I think some decisions that you'll make in life are wrong. And everybody watching this channel will be wrong because we're human beings. But in the heat of that moment, with all that pressure, in hindsight, it's so easy for anybody who's not in that job to turn around and go, we, we should have handled it this way. Now, this is the question that's got to be asked. Has he learned from that situation? And would he make that mistake again? We'll find out next time. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's, the, that's, the, that's the only way we'd know. And it's not me giving him a free pass or saying that because he's a friend of mine. But there's business decisions that he's made that I don't think are right. And I, he'd be the first person I'd tell that. There's... Comments have been made about him that I don't think are fair. When somebody puts his address online, they put his, address, his home address online. When somebody said, uh, if I ever see him at a convention, I'll do this. I've been online at line and found his address at company house, and here it is. Like, and people threatening to go around to his house where, he, where his partner lives and his dogs. Like, that's not acceptable. Like, and, 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 it, and if, if anybody wants to do that, like, let me know first and I'll meet you there. Because... That's not fair. And I do the same for any time I found out somebody would be in bed. He, he has made decisions in the past and burnt bridges with people and done things that I don't think he should have done. Um, has he been right in every situation? No, he's not. But like you say, one thing I 100% agree with you on, that if you're going to pull those strings and make those decisions, then just come forwards and be the face of it. If, you, if you're universally not liked, like all people have a negative opinion you the only way you can change that is to come forwards and, and put your face out there and say look this is me this is who i am this is what's happened like like you know and i can tell you that most people if you actually get time to meet g and i'm not talking in business i mean outside of business like he's not he's not a bad person like he isn't a bad person he I think sometimes he, you know, he he's like a lot of people. I think he's just somebody that that wants to prove his way in the world. And I think that sometimes he makes bad decisions, but sometimes he makes amazing decisions. You know, you look at the you look at the marketing for things like Pyro, Pyro Mini. Like he's made incredible decisions and made the company a lot of money. And I bet if you put his track record out, like on campaigns that were successful against campaigns that weren't, he'd have a lot more successful campaigns than negative ones but you know in the words of kelly jones it only takes one tree to make a thousand matches it only takes one match to burn a thousand trees and we're not remembered for all the good things that we do we're, we're brought up on all the bad things so yeah. so you know let's see what the future of illusionist holds and let's see what let's see what he does and I, like like if he ever I mean, if he's watching this and you and you ever want to ask me about anything that I think you should do or, you you know, if I've got my ear to the ground and I can see something you can't see and you want a piece of advice on that, I'm always willing to offer. I'm sure that if he rang you up and said, Craig, what do you think I should do from here? 
you'd give them a piece of advice on it. You wouldn't ignore it, you know? Happily. Yeah, not at all. In fact, we've spoken on the phone once already and we're having another chat. So, yeah, yeah. and he, he, you know, you know, that's the thing is that he is willing to listen and he's, and he's willing to take on board. I'm, like, like I say, I'm sure if you told him that social media were lacking, he can see the numbers. Yeah. See what I mean, like, like a blind man can see the numbers. So I know that he knows. Well, I get it. I get running a business. I know it's, it's a lot of it's like spitting plates. You know, you cut, it's very difficult to keep all of those plates spinning because you start focusing on the Kickstarter's plate and making sure that that's really spinning. And then the social media plate starts to slow down and starts to, I get that. I totally get that. But you, you know, there's only like three members of staff at the company. So that's another thing is like, there's not, there's only like Garain, Dwayne who films and edits everything and Oban Jones, that's it. Like, and then you might have like somebody in the background who just keeps every so often coming in and doing the uptake of the upkeep of the websites. And then somebody who might be dealing with the R&D, but I don't know, I, I don't know whether those people are, like part-time, full-time, I don't know, but I know that there's three integral members of that company. It's not a, there's, the, when you put it into this perspective, right, so so look at it this way, there are the same amount of people that are illusionists as there are the 1914. So think about the volume of orders and the volume of emails and the volume of comments and the volume of that and, and understand that the company is only the same size as the 1914. It's like, like Murphy's, in two cubicles probably have more members of staff than illusionist. Do you know what I mean? So it's like they they do a lot, like they they they're balancing a lot. And like you say, it is like spinning plates and and people think it's this big corporation. But the reason they think that, and I agree 100 percent is because there's not somebody in the background that's saying, look, here I am. I'm the one that's going to be making these decisions. I'm the one that's going to be doing this. I'm not saying that G should come out and and do projects. I mean, he's a very talented magician. A lot of people don't know that. Like, he's not, he's a good magician. Like, in his terms of his cardistry, he's amazing. Like, we, I, I've been on shoots with him where, he, as a director, he's great. Like, and people don't see his true skill. Like, he has an eye for stuff that a lot don't. I don't, but I'm not saying he should come out and do tricks, but maybe come out and even take care of the social media by doing weekly uploads from his house on a mobile phone saying, look, guys, like, this is this. This is what changes we're going to make. This is where we are. We, we're going to be in contact with the people. Or even an email, like write out an email and do like a monthly email or a weekly email with a newsletter of things that are going to happen. Yeah. You know, it's an, it's an easy fix, but it's just enacting that. And I'd, like, if there wasn't so much pressure for him to succeed, maybe he'd be doing that. I don't know. Maybe if everybody just backed off a little bit. And just give him a chance to to show what he's really capable of, and and worst case scenario, what happens? Like Brad Christian sells the company, that's it. Yeah. And it's the end of an era. But I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm like I'm. What I'm saying is that that. You know, we don't know what the future is going to hold. Um, putting all the weight onto one person, I think, is a bit unfair. Whether I change the demographic there, I don't know. Like, I'm not going to take responsibility for the quality of stuff that comes out of their warehouses. And I won't be held responsible for it. Like, I'm openly stating that. I don't know what the quality of the performance is going to be like. Like, I'm not I'm not saying for a second they're going to be bad. That's another thing I want to mention. They're not, you know, I'm I'm all right. I'm not saying I'm good at performing. I'm all right. So maybe, maybe, maybe it's just I look at it and go, that's not to the standard that I'd like. But to most people, that might be an okay standard. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know the explanations are worth the weight in gold. I know the rise gimmick is an incredible gimmick. Every every prop that's in the box, there are more than that. But every prop that's in the box, like I've really done my own work on, I've got all the relevant permissions. You know, so let's well, just I mean, see. What you, you, you've turned me into a purchaser. I mean, just by talking about it, genuinely, I'm going to go. And well, let, let's just see what it does. You know, let's 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 see what it does and. Uh, and yeah, do you have any more questions about anything outside of illusions? One illusion? last question for you, okay. which is the question that I think a lot of people wanted me to ask you, which is what's coming up next? Uh, what's Pete Turner's next move? Because you all, you must have something in mind. You've been away from illusionists for six months now. What's your game plan over the coming weeks and months and years? Do you know that for the first time ever, 
like I, I've always consulted for years. I've consulted, like I worked on, I, I wrote, do you know, I wrote down a comp, like a full list of everything that I'd worked on a couple of months, well, maybe four months back, I wrote down this list and I sat back and looked at it and thought to myself, like, wow, I didn't think that I'd done that much. Like, like it, when I, when I sat back and looked at it from the outside looking in, I thought, wow, like I can't actually believe I've had this many opportunities and worked on this much right over such a, such a wide span of stuff. Now, the reason that I mentioned that is that at this moment in time, I'm working on like six productions, like six full productions, all, all simultaneously, like from ranging from talent shows to Netflix to upcoming uh, shows that I can't really say much about, but like, I know that, that, my aim really is just to focus on that for a bit. Like I, I want to give my attention to that and I want to make sure that I do right by the people that I'm working with. And and I have more skin invested in one of those productions than than the the lot of them. I mean, and by skin I mean I've time invested working on it. And and maybe that'll become a full-time thing. <clears throat> I'd like it to be. I mean, I could say that that's but I'm not a I'm not a shortage of things that I can do. Yeah. That's, you know, it's really, it's crazy. Excuse me, I get a bit of a tickly throat, but I'm not a, I'm not a shortage of things to do. I like, for the first time in my entire life, I feel like I don't, years and years ago, I'd be sat back going, okay, what's my move for the next six months? Like, what's this? And, and, opportunities are presenting themselves every single day for me so it's come down to the point where i feel the world's my oyster and like what what you've seen is version one of me and then moving into the next i mean as soon as the next thing i'm going to do is drop some weight go to the gym like we're outside of covid you know like everybody put a bit of weight on anyway really difficult to stay totally healthy but i'm going to go back i'm going to sort myself out um weight wise uh, I'm going to get in better shape. I'm going to get healthier. And I think that the next 2.0 is is where I'm really going to shine. Like I'm really taking, I'm finally at a place where I'm proficient at what I do. And I don't mean that egotistically. I mean that out of pride. Like you put me onto a television set. I know exactly where everybody needs to be. I know exactly what everybody needs to be doing. I know exactly down to the second now whether something's working the way it should. I know the channels that I have to go through if I want to, produce a book to the highest standard i know that if i want to produce a deck of cards who to talk to if i wanted to produce my own television show or youtube series i know the exact people to contact to be able to do that i'm like i'm i've literally got all the choice in the world to do whatever i want so the future is just going to be is going to be me writing all the wrongs that i've made in the past or improving on things that you know, that I worked on in the past that maybe I, I felt were a little bit like, oh, I could have done that differently. Or in hindsight, like I say, you have twenty twenty vision in hindsight. Um, and again, like I say, none of this out of ego, you know, like I'm just, I'm a normal person. Like I, like I, I wake up the same as everybody else. I eat, drink and sleep, you know, like I'm not, I'm not any different to anybody that's watching this. I don't profess to be, I don't think that I'm some messiah that, that deserves this recognition. Look, I just want to read my mentalism books and I wanna I just want to perform and I want to have fun. And I just want to, I just you know, I want to be able to to show people that you you can have fun with this stuff. That's what it's about. And don't and and I think along the way somewhere, like I, I'd lost that a little bit. And I'm not saying with illusionist, I'm just saying in general, like I'd I'd got to a point where okay, this is blocked in for this month. This is blocked in for this. Like I'm working on shows that have budgets that you won't believe. And like I can literally cook some up in my imagination and and I see it from come from something that's metaphysical and turn into something physical. And it's like, it's mind blowing some of the the things that I can achieve now that I could never achieve. Yeah. And so, you know, so that's, that's what the future holds. So it's just going to be fun. It's just going to be fun. It's going to be packed with just living life the way that I want to live it, spending some time with my family and just, you know, finally having a more of a social life as well. Like, like it's afforded me that. Yeah. Like I'm so bad on social media. 
I'm so bad at getting back to people. I'm so bad at responding to emails and text messages and calls. Like I'm going to, like I have a very small circle of like friends that I meet with every so often, but it's going to be more going out with the family, more spending time. Like, you know, my brother is like recently, my brother's an artist. He's a very, very good artist. And so I might, I might dip my toe into the art world. And then work some out with my brother, you know, like and do that. And uh, like I'm building a, a on on Instagram. I've just I've recently put. I'm going off on a bit of a tangent now for a minute or so. But then I think it's a great note to leave on. I've just put an engine with a couple of friends of mine, Neil and Steve, into a a 1969 fastback uh, Mustang. And so I've just this is the this is the engine that's gone in. I put all like bear in mind that we've dressed all this, and so that's just gone in. Like it's a big V8 a nice 289 and i've put all that in it's it's going to be a nice little show car when that's done um spent spending hours on that my hawk like flying my bird it's going to be so i didn't I spent even know you had a hawk until you told me the other day i'm like that's but it, it doesn't surprise me that pete turner would have a pet hawk i mean that's it's well my dad were a falconer for years and years and what happened was i didn't really if i'm 100 percent honest i didn't really want to get into that field i've done it since i were a kid like i, I used to do gala shows so when i were younger i do falconry displays and so from the age of about six years old they were right you're going to man this bird and for people that don't know what manning a bird is you literally sit with for hours upon hours with a bird on your hand until it become acclimatized or accustomed to people and then like any movements you'd make, it'd be used to. And, it, you know, I used to do that for my dad. And then it were, right, okay, you know, his friend Liam's doing these shows. Do you want to earn yourself £50 to go and do these shows? And what I'd do is I'd, I'd have to load all the birds in, make sure that the, the meals were prepared right. Then I they he'd fly them around and I'd get to fly, like, line, they call them line birds, and line birds are on a crayons. And so I did that for years and then I went flying birds with my dad. And so it really ingrained into me from about six years old. And then obviously my dad passed away in 2017. All the birds got passed off to other people. I didn't want anything to do with them. Um, and I got a call out of the blue from, I got a call out of the blue from somebody over in South Aurum, a friend of my dad, somebody who knew my dad really well. And basically Two two birds had been injured, and he'd taken these rescue birds in, these two Harris hawks, and they put them into a muse together, and these Harris hawks had bred, and then they'd had chicks, and they, they stayed with a family for a 60, it's normally about 16 weeks. Every single one of the birds, apart from one, got taken, and this one bird that had not got taken had never seen a human, was so vocal that she was starting to attack her parents, the parents had damaged wings, so couldn't teach the bird to fly. And because the bird were four months old or five months old, nobody would take it on because it would pass the point of being decently trainable. And so he said, look, it's a, it's a lost cause. Like we can't, we've taken it out. We've had it out for two days, three days. What's it still? And, and there used to be an old technique in, in like the art of falconry where you'd, in the medieval periods when falconry were really prominent in, in England or hawking, they'd sit with a bird for until it fell asleep on your hand. Now that you don't do that anymore. It's not, there's better ways to train birds. And, and so when I took it on, it were a nightmare. And when I say a nightmare, I mean a nightmare, like screeching, grabbing with its foot and its foot, can, it's got a couple of tons worth of pressure if it gets older you and squeezes, it could crush your bones and go right in its hospital job and, and wouldn't be hooded. Like no matter how hard you try to man her, she just won't having it. And, and it's a weight game with birds. So you have to drop, drop them to a very specific weight. And it's the, the difference between a couple of pounds, uh, sorry, a couple of ounces, a couple of ounces can make the difference between you, your bird going off and never coming back or not even being trainable. And you have to take them down almost to death's door so they become reliant on you as a food source and then build them back up. But there's a percentage of birds that just outright refuse to eat. And she were one of these birds that just refuse to eat, like round people will not eat. So I had to come up with like creative methods to train her to eat whilst I were in the room. And from like putting her above me on a perch and laying there for hours. And anyway, it became an excuse to, to get out and walk. 
and I took this bird on because I, I inevitably knew that this bird were for the chopping block. That had been it. It won't get, it wasn't going to do anything. And so I, so I took, it took me about, th it, normally it's about three to four weeks to train a Harris Hawk. It's not a very long period of time. But then one day I just went out and my will beat hers. You know, so then, so then, she, like, like I, I outlasted it. was still mate, and I won. And then, and then she started eating for the first time off the glove, and I'm like, right, now we can make progress. And I managed to get her to jump, start at about six inches. They jump, and then you'll go a foot away, and she refused to come. So you go back to six inches. Now it takes sixteen minutes for her to come to the end, and it would like one step forwards, two steps back, one step forwards, until I managed to get her on a line, and I took her to a cricket pitch, and I had her flying, and then. And then the day comes where you go, right, she's never going to survive in the wild. She's never going to be able to survive in the wild because she doesn't know how to hunt. She's, imagine being a human being that can't fly, training a bird that's never been taught to fly to fly. That's the situation you're up against, right? So it's like, anyway, I managed to get her going. And then, and then the day came where you take the rope off and you're like, right, if, if she trusts me enough, she's going to fly off and come back. And then... She just did, and then that were it. And so it's been one of those where we have this, it's a working relationship. It's not a, they're never going to be domesticated like dogs. Yeah. You know, so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a means to, it's a means to an end for her. And for me, I get to be able to take time out walking her. She follows me like a dog. So if I walk down through the trees, I don't need to put any food out. She'll literally just, if I don't call her, she'll come to find where I am and she'll, she'll then come in when I, when I call her in and, yeah, so she's she's uh, she's back out now. So season just started again. So maybe out doing that. So maybe spend some more time with my hawk, which is a long a long winded way of saying that I probably lead the most weird life. Uh, you really do, mate. <laughs> you really do. But yeah, I, I have a lot of passions outside of magic that I'd love to. Like I were a session musician, like when my first son Zachary were born fourteen years ago. It's 14 going 15. So 14 years ago, I was a session musician at the time. And uh, and maybe I'd go back to doing something with music. Like I miss I miss being in a band and I've never really had the time over the last decade to do anything with that. Um, my Hawks and I love my cars and motorbikes and maybe get back into doing Speedway. But taking, taking what I'm doing in this and finding ways to excel in that and maybe help my brother out in the art game, that might be some of the future who knows these are all just pie in the sky ideas but the world is literally open to me with the connections that i've made to to just have some fun for a bit that's great you know and and, and there's i feel i feel unstoppable and i don't mean in a way that there are people trying to stop me i just mean that like it, it normally takes people a long long time to fully take control of their life and I think that that I'm finally at a place where my emotions are in check, my patience is in check, my stress levels are in check. Like I'm not, I'm not falling out with people. I'm not young and hungry to argue with people. You know, I can I've finally make any business decision I want to make. I know what the, the right people to see, and I'm not short for work. So, so I think the the future holds nothing but happiness. The future's bright, right? That's it. And, yeah. and, and and let's be honest, whatever you end up doing, you're going to be successful doing it because that's just what you do. I can just tell people are wired that way. And I can tell that you're, you're the sort of person that will put 100% in and just keep going and keep going and keep going until it's a success. It's all we can do, you know. So if you're watching this and you want to get into magic and mentalism, the way to do it is really simple. It's just give it your all. Like it, like, and, and I'll tell you, on the way up, it's not it's not easy, you know. Like Like when you... The, the bit that annoys me the most is I don't care about really what people say about me when it's unfounded commentary, like bias magic reviews. But it's like my son has to read those comments when you're saying stuff about my appearance and, you know, like everybody's somebody's father, son, brother, you know, like or sister or auntie, whatever. Like I'm just a regular person. If you've watched me in the past and you think I've been arrogant, I apologise for that. It's not It's nothing other than a character that were played in that moment because I'm a, the honesty is I'm we're actors playing parts. Do you know what I mean? I'm, uh, that were the act that were the character that I needed to play in that project because 
directorially that's the vision that I had and I, and I played it and if you believed it and you believed that I never bought a drink or you thought I was that arrogant that I never bought a drink well then at least I were doing my job right because the acting obviously works you know and the result of it's a different it's just a character yeah yeah I get that and and just hopefully people can see that and and don't don't be shy you know like if I'm at a convention and you want to come and say hello don't feel that you can't come up and talk to me I've got time for anybody you know, I saw that. I mean, uh, at the London Magic Convention, you had all of the kids that there were a lot of kids at that convention, including Ryland, and you were just there. And I, I know a lot of the kids. And then afterwards, I spoke to Killian and Ryland and Arabella and all the people that were there. And I was like, "What? What did you like the best?" And they were like, "Oh, Pete, he was amazing. Like you're just shaping the young minds of the, uh, you know, the the future there." And Nobody asked you to do that. It wasn't like it was a session. You were just in the bar, surrounded by kids, just like blowing their mind over and over again. And it was just like you know, that it's it's incredible what they're doing. I mean, Ryland is a perfect example of it. You know, they they really are the future, and it, and just it's great that they have a passion for it. And I don't mind, like I say, a lot, a lot of, and I've seen it. I've seen. I'm not you know not naming any names. I've seen big names, and I use inverted commas because there's no such thing as a big name. It's just a. It's just a. They're just people, big names. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm in the middle of a conversation. Mm. Like, yeah, yeah, I don't. Oh, should we get up and and go? Like, and they'll get up and walk off. Do you know mm. what I mean? It's like, it's like I'm not, I'm not like that. Like, I, I'm not going to say who I was with at the convention, but I was with a pretty big name at the convention who is, who is outside of magic, a, a relatively big name. Yeah, yeah. And and I left that person to sit down and talk to everybody else. It wasn't, do you know what I mean? It, it wasn't like, I'm not, I don't, I just want to, like, like I said, I just want to share my heart. I want to have fun. And I love listening to their ideas. Like, you know, your Ryland's got some incredible stuff. And if people are not following his journey, I highly recommend looking at it because when I say the kid, I don't mean it in a derogatory sense, but the kid's got, got some future ahead of him with some of the stuff that he's doing. And he was talking to me about a couple of the ideas and asked me my opinion on some stuff. And he's he's a super sharp, you should be so proud. He's a super sharp young man and he, he's got an incredible mind. And also just watching his consistency and he's actually doing gigs. You know, yeah. that's, that's he's out there doing it. Like he's, and, and you know, you were telling me he's got two 40 minute shows. That's more than most working pros. Yeah. You know, and he's nine, ten. He's literally just turned ten last week. Yeah, so it's like, you know, ten years old, and he's already doing it, and that's the thing. And and if you are young and you're watching this, and you're or you're somebody, you know, don't don't give too much stock to what the negative things that people say. You can't let it stop you, and you can. There's only certain times you should respond to it. And I've had this discussion with you. Like if you are young and you're watching this and, and people are saying negative things about your performance online, if it's something that's that's said by everybody, then maybe it's something to change. But normally people comment when they when you've succeeded in an area that they can't understand why they haven't succeeded. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's it. So don't take it what people say too personally. And the, the higher you climb or the, the higher you're perceived to climb, because you're never really climbing anywhere, but the higher, because none of us, none of us really know what we're doing. We're just doing it, right? Like, <laughs> the higher you're perceived to climb, the more critics you're going to get because you're, you're on more people's radar. And the only difference is that when, when there were only one or two people who knew who you were, there were only one or two people that could have ever said anything. When hundreds or thousands of people know who you are, they think that you're at a perceived level where you'll never know who they are. Yet you can see that people are saying things because you're still where you were. You've never changed. Do you know I mean, the only difference is that there's more people. So based on probability, there's going to be more people that say negative things. Mm -hmm. I say, so just don't take it literally. And, you know, if you want to get into magic and mentalism, just give it your all. Go out there, have fun. And just remember, like, it's, it's not to be overthought. That'd be great. You are a national treasure. I can't wait to get you back on this uh, this channel again. <laughs> I really can't. I just, do you know what? I just ramble on like I I, I, I realized this recently. I just, I'm going to be like, I'm not going to have cats because I'm not a cat person, but I'm going to be a cat woman without cats. I just sit and talk to myself for hours and I'm just <laughs> a hawk person. You just be surrounded by hawks. Oh yeah, I have fucking loads of them. I'm just mad. I don't, I don't know. I can't. I, I do, if I do go on and I do apologize, I don't mean to. Like I really don't mean to.
I I said this last time I interviewed you, and 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 the same holds true this time. This has been an incredible interview, a masterclass, and just a really great way to find out who you are. Because I think a lot of people don't realize who Pete Turner is, and I think if they watch this whole interview, they realize just how much integrity and ethics and and love for the art that you have, and you know that's just so admirable in so many different ways it really well, thank is thank you for that and i hope it does come across because it really is it, it's my life you know what i mean it's my life it's my love my first love i can tell i can tell yeah well thank you for your time and thank you for sitting and listening to me go on mate you're more than welcome and and anybody who's listening to this they can leave a comment down below and and i'm sure you'll read it and um yeah also follow you on instagram follow you on uh, on, on facebook and all that fun stuff and I'm sure you'll let people know where the next phase of your journey is taking you in due course when you've uh, you figured it yourself. But you seem to be very busy with consulting and everything at the moment. So, well, that's the, one that's... last question, actually. Actually, I know that somebody's going to ask this in the comments. So let's just wrap it up with this one question. You mentioned that you're consulting with a couple of talent shows. I'm guessing that's either Got Talent somewhere in the world or something to do with Got Talent. If somebody is watching this from somewhere in the world and they've got an act that they want to do on Got Talent and they're serious about it, are you able to be hired as a consultant? Is that something that people could reach out to you for? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to take anything away from Russ Stevens because Russ Stevens is the go-to guy for this sort of stuff. So firstly... But Russ only works in the UK and you work all over that's the it. world. Right, so, oh, so yeah. I mean... Know what you're getting into first and foremost with talent shows. I mean, ta it doesn't. I mean, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole if I if I'm not careful. But know what you're getting into. It's never what it's perceived to be, and the producers do have a big say in what can go into the act and what can't. They they have a big say in in a lot of different areas of like, oh, this can be said, this can't be said. And the weirdest one for me is that this method can be used. This method can't be used, even though they know nothing about magic. And it's like you, you could put, you could perform three completely different effects with the same method that look totally different. And the method's the only thing the audience doesn't see. So what difference does it make if you're utilizing that method? But it matters to them. So so know what you're getting into. But if you're getting into a talent show, you want to hire me as a consultant, yeah, I'm, I'm available for that. And the bit that you've got to understand, and this is the bit that, that is so important, I don't create from my perspective, I create for, for you. It's tailor-made for you. So stylistically, it's very difficult for me to be able to impart how much I actually know about that area of performance without showing you examples of what I've done. And I don't want to show you examples of what I've done because it's a, unless it's private, a lot of it's private. You sign NDAs, you, you, and that's not for everybody. I mean, there is sometimes I can talk about stuff, but stylistically, when I write something for television, I'm not writing for me, I'm writing for you. So it's however you want to be perceived. And I'll always be honest and I'll always, I'm not a yes man. So I'll say, this is a problem with this. I think that you want to do this, but you've got this amount of time. So we need to compromise here or here. And, and one thing that people don't understand about TV, especially talent shows, and, and just look at, look at Ben Hart, look at Anton Flynn, look at Will Sy. They can edit those shows to make you look however they want. And one thing that I've become really proficient at, and this is a bonus or a benefit for anybody, is understanding how to control the narrative of what's being said, where you are at certain points, so that they can't clip bits out, which mean two things. One, you're getting maximum airtime, but two, you're controlling the narrative of the edit before it's even got onto the cutting room floor, which means that they can't get you in the ways that they've edited those other performers' acts to make them look stupid. And that's something that you don't just learn in an hour or a week. It's, it, I think a lot of people think that it's so easy to be a consultant. And I read a I read a blog on it recently, and it's it was written about somewhere. I can't remember where I read it. I read a blog about it, but it was so true. It were like it were like everybody's a consultant. You know, it's it's easy to think that you just pick a marketed effect off of a shelf and say put this in, and and but you've got to get the clearance for that effect is there a cost to use the for the tv rights have you got written permissions for it when you're taking that off of a shelf what makes you different to the other thousand people that are performing that is there a unique way that we can take this and we can perform it 
is there, you know, is there an angle that we've not looked at presentationally? This this product can it be used in a different way in the other than the way that it's been marketed, so that it doesn't even resemble the look of it? We'll take the technique, but we'll change the prop. Well, do, is that enough to get round the television rights for it? Should we still reach out? I understand all that, and I understand how the act should look and how it should work, and I am hireable. Um, everything is tailor made, right down to the scripts. I'll help you find sources and resources that you didn't think that, that you know that would be possible, or, or I direct you in the right areas. And even if it's something that I don't know, like like it's not just subject to mentalism, I consult for a lot of magic, which is I, I can say to you, look, you put you want to put this in a box. Okay, we want this to vanish from this box. I don't know how that works. I can give you the script. I can give you what it should look like. I should give you them. I can give you the visual imagery to introduce the phone. I can tell you what's supposed to happen when it goes in the box. And now I can find the person that's going to be able to help us with the box. I can do my research and I can find out how we make it vanish. The method's the least important part. That can be done after we've designed the act. Yeah. Right. And that, and that, so, so I'm very good at, well, you know, not egotistically, I'm very good at being able to design good imagery. Like imagery that stands out and makes you look like it's unique. And, you know, I'm working, I can't say who it is or what it's for, but I'm working with somebody and we're working on the fill deck. Yeah. Like we, we literally, like the, and, but when you watch it, when you watch this routine, I guarantee you won't stand there and go, oh, that's just the fill deck. You won't even know it's the fill deck, the way that it's been designed and built, but it's got us round the, I call them the gatekeepers, that, that it's got us round the producers to be able to green light something to go onto the show. And it, it's not even the fill deck. It's not produced like the fill deck. It doesn't look like the fill deck. It doesn't even resemble the fill deck. But it takes us into the heat of the theatrical the theatrical moments that we did want to pass. And what we we had to compromise on that bit to make this bit happen. Got you. Yeah. All in a timely fashion, which doesn't seem possible for me because it seems like I'm just talking and talking and talking. But yes, I am. If you want to, if you want to talk about consultancy. Just, just email me at peterturnermind at hotmail.co.uk. It's always best to have a soundboard. If, you, if, if you're just looking to do a pilot for a TV show or get on TV or be put in the right direction, I'll give you advice for free. I'm not, you know, like if you came at me and said, look, I, I need help with this. I don't know if I need a consultant. What do you think about this? I've got a storyboard for that. I'll give you the time of day to talk to you about it. Like, but before I can commit to blocking out hours of my time like a, like a car you know I can't do something like that without a contract in place yeah that's a different thing but I'll, I'll I'll always you know if you said to me look Pete I don't have a budget for this I've looked at this off the top of your head could you think of a better approach to that I'd write you back or I'd call you and I'd give you the advice I'm not I'm not it's not you know I'm not here to it's not about the money you know what i mean it's about i want it done right and i can help you with that but at the same time like i won't i i, can't, I don't have the time in the day to to do that over and over and over and over again for everybody so if you want to book me as a consultant it's possible just email me tell me what it is it doesn't matter whether it's a television show theater show corporate events it doesn't matter if it's just your live act if you just want an hour to go over your you could pay for me an hour on skype to go over your act and go, what's good about it? What's terrible? What needs changing? Like, what can be fixed? What can be saved? What should I burn? You know, like, like an, and I've and I, and I found that people trust my opinion. You know, like people, once they booked me once, I, I don't think I've ever not had anybody not book a repeat session. In fact, some people I've had working relationships with since two thousand and twelve when I first started consulting and I'm still working with those people. And when those, like recently, one of those people, Netflix have just approached them to do a show. So it's already, the budget's already signed off on. And the very first person contacted were me to look at the show. And I ended up looking at the storyboard and saying, look, I think we should change this storyboard. So I ended up actually working as a writer on the show as opposed to just a consultant. So if you need somebody to help you write storyboard, I, you know, I can do all that as well. Sorry, again, I went off on a tangent. Oh, that's that's the answer I was looking for. That's amazing. I think a lot of I think you, I, I think a lot of people needed to know that because you know there's a lot of opportunities out there these days. You know, there's a lot of uh, got talent. Become, I mean, we've got this uh, magic special coming up in a few days' time. 
uh, you know, there's there's so many opportunities for people to get on TV that might not have been on TV before. And I think that you need to make sure you've got the right people around you. It's, and, and it's not only that, you've got to remember that TV is becoming, TV is becoming a casualty to social media. This is, this is undoubtedly the best time to pitch a show. And the reason it's the best time is because you, if you get it right on the tail end of television, they're screaming out for people to go on television. And then they, what they do is they call cross platform. So they'll then text snippets of that to bump up their social media. But if you can, if you can hit that, then automatically what happens is you get put across and put on social media, and then you've got a show reel that you can use to take in to then move on to one of the streaming platforms. And and Got Talent is a good way to do that. But like I say, you have got to take into it's, – it's not what you think it is. I can't say too much because I don't want to – unless you've been on the show and understand it or you've worked with somebody that's been on the show, there's a lot of hoops that you have to jump through. Oh, I I know this from Ryland's journey through BGT and seeing it firsthand. I know and, and that's it. And they and people think it's as simple as just, oh, use this marketed product, use this, use that. It's not. It's nothing like that. It's like it is so different. And and you've just got to be aware of what you're getting into. Same with television. Like it's very, it's very easy to not understand bumps and back ends. And it's very easy to not to put yourself in a situation where they go, oh, we're going to give you 20 grand to do this episode. And you go, oh, fucking 20 grand is a lot of money. And then, you know, when, and then you realize that actually by the time you've paid for locations, because you can't just film anywhere for free without permits. By the time you've got yourself a coordinator that's then getting paid a wage, that's then running, and then you've got to do with, deal with the legal side of the back end for the release forms. And then you've got to worry about the expenses of everything. And then you might then you might see somebody that's designed a prop and go, oh, I want to use this prop. And then you say, how much is it for the rights for television? And they go, oh, it's going to be 10 grand to use it. And you're like, okay, now that's 10 grand of your, bu- 10 grand of your budget burnt. Do you know what I mean? Like understanding that asking for the most out of the budget is important and having somebody just to sit there and run backwards and forwards with for the ideas you're going to take into the pitch meetings is important. You know, it could be one sentence that makes the difference between you getting the show and not. It could be certain like trigger terms and keywords that make a difference. And this probably all sounds like fluff to anybody that's a consultant that's watching this that thinks, oh, well, I, I just go and I give ideas. Yeah, but that's not just where my services end. You know, like I, I can give you ideas if that's what you want. I can give you a million and one. But I can also help you with the getting your foot in the door. I can also help you designing something to get noticed or get seen. I'm not guaranteeing that you will get a TV show by talking to me. I can't guarantee that but I can give you the best opportunity and put you into the right places to be seen and put you in contact with the right people. Yeah. You know, but yeah, uh, like, but I won't say got talents, a speciality of mine. It's just something I do. It's one, it's one portion of, and I've done a lot of it. I think I've worked on, I've worked on Britain's got talent. I've worked on America's got talent. Poland's got talent. Norway's got talent. Italy's got talent. So I've done Done, done a few, you know. Yeah, kept yourself busy with it. Wow. And, and I'm not saying I've done just one act. You know, like I've had multiple acts on those platforms. So it's, or, or I've had people that'll say, can you help me with this? I'm, I want, I don't know which show to go on this one or this one. And I'll help, you know, I can help you make decisions like that as well. So that's awesome. That's brilliant. So the email will be at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you, uh, if you think that you could, use Pete's help, drop him an email. He might be able to help you. But man, honestly, one more time, this has been an incredible interview. Thank you so much. Time has flown by. It's been a masterclass. I think everybody's going to love this. I wanted a really special episode to go out on Christmas Day. This delivered and then some. So thank you so much, Pete. Well, thank you for having me on. And to everybody that's watching that celebrates Christmas, Merry Christmas. And to those people that celebrate any other Holiday, happy holidays. Nice. I hope you've had a wonderful time and just take a bit of time away from your computer after this and spend some time with your family. Honestly, once once that time goes by, you're not getting it back. I agree completely. Pete, thank you so much. What an amazing <laughs> way to finish the interview. Guys, like I said, leave a comment down below. Merry Christmas, happy holidays. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another video. So I'll see you then. On behalf of Pete Turner, thanks for watching. Mm-hmm.